Okay, I hope everyone had a nice lunch. It's 12.30, we have quorum, and we're going to start. So um, we're going to, it's, uh, we're at 8.1. We are a staff presentation, our city survey 2022. And I think we're all looking forward to seeing this. Cyrus Tarani, Chief Digital Officer and Director of Innovation, Lisa Zingerwich, Manager of Corporation Initiative, and Amy Tan, Senior Project Manager, Strategy. Performance and data integration are with us to provide the presentation. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Ladies. Thank you, uh, uh, Madam Chair and members of council. I'd like to pass it over to Lisa, who's our manager of corporate initiatives, and Amy Tam, who you've already introduced, to provide council with the details of the 22 survey results. Thank you. Hey, so thank you everybody and uh, good afternoon. As mentioned, my name is Lisa Zinkowicz and I'm the Manager of Corporate Initiatives in the Digital Innovation and Strategic Partnerships Division. Today we're here to present the results of the 2022 Our City Survey. This survey is a point in time survey and collects feedback and opinions on the perception of the quality of life in Hamilton, views towards the city's vision and priorities, provides a very high level assessment of quality and usage of city services, and gives us insights into the quality of interactions with the city, preference for service delivery and communication channels, as well as views towards how the city is doing in regards to public engagement. Within the presentation of the 2022 Our City Survey results, as this is the third iteration of the Our City Survey, where possible, we will highlight trends against previous years. Although both random phone and self-selected online surveys were completed, the majority of the results presented in both the staff report and in today's presentation focus on the random phone survey. Full results for both methodologies have been provided as Appendix A and Appendix B to the staff report. The results between the phone and online, however, cannot be directly compared due to the differences in survey methodology. In order to raise awareness of the R-City survey, multiple digital and print mediums were utilized throughout the duration of the survey to encourage participation. To present the results, I'd like to introduce Amy Tan, Senior Project Manager, Strategy Performance and Data Integration, the internal lead on the Our City Survey. But before I do, I just want to note that we are aware that the results infographic labeled as Appendix D on in the staff report is not displaying properly, so we're going to be fixing that on the web network. So Amy? All right, thank you, Lisa. And good afternoon, Deputy Mayor and members of Council. Um, I'll start off today uh, with presenting the survey methodologies and outcome. The survey was available between November 1st and December 18th of 2022. The participant had to be an adult aged 18 or older residing in Hamilton. The survey was conducted by phone, online, and paper. The phone survey was administered by a third party vendor where Hamilton based residential and cellular phones were randomly called. The survey collected 1,052 responses. The data are weighted by ward and age according to the Hamilton census to reflect the city's population. The phone results are accurate to plus minus 3%, 19 out of 20. To supplement the phone survey, an online survey was available on Engage Hamilton where all Hamilton residents could participate. The online survey collected 2,500 responses. No margin of error can be applied to this methodology due to self-selection bias. There were no completed paper surveys submitted. 
Before uh, we get into the survey results, I would just like to note there were some challenges and limitations to the phone survey. Um, the council approved margin of error at the ward level and the city level was not met. This challenge has been confirmed by other municipalities due to the changes in social behavior of not answering calls from an unknown number. Due to the inability to meet the council approved margin of error at the ward level, this report highlights citywide results only. The analysis also assumes the particip particip participant understood the differences between city services and services provided by other agencies. Uh, again, the online results cannot uh, be directly compared to the phone results. So today's presentation primarily comes from the statistically representative phone sample. Where possible, we compared the results to previous years in the online survey. So getting into the respondent profile, this is helpful to keep in mind when reviewing the survey results. The distribution of respondents according to gender is balanced. 65% of the phone survey respondents were aged 55 or older, which is higher than the census data at 40%. The last chart here shows the distribution of respondent by ward. The representation is fairly balanced with lower participation in ward 11 and 15. The first key area in today's result sharing is the quality of life. Overall, most respondents reported they were satisfied or very satisfied with their life in Hamilton. <coughs> most respondents agree that Hamilton is a great place to live, work, play, and learn. Comparing to the previous year's results, the perception of Hamilton as a great place to live and play has dropped. We also see a similar trend in this question where it asks, in the past two years, would you say the quality of life in Hamilton has improved, stayed the same, or worsened? 45% of the respondents said their quality of life has worsened. This is trending negatively over time. However, this is not unique to the city of Hamilton with a trend of lower satisfaction in post-COVID surveys are being observed by other municipalities in Canada. One of the many variables that may have impacted the quality of life results is the COVID-19 pandemic. Although most respondents reported that it has not had a significant change to their financial, mental, and physical health, close to one third of the respondents described that it has worsened their life. Moving on to views toward the city's vision and priorities. Connecting the survey to our vision of being the best place to raise a child and age successfully. Less than half of the respondents agreed that, the Hamilton, is, that Hamilton is on the right track to achieving our vision. This is trending negatively over time. When we ask the respondent, what is the one thing you think the city should do to reach its vision? One third of the respondents identified addressing social issues as the top priority. This is consistent with the online survey result. Social issues mainly comprised of comments related to housing and rental affordability, homeless and poverty, daycare and children's services, youth services, and senior services. The next key topic we have today is assessing the quality and usage of the city services. Nearly half of the respondents are satisfied, were very satisfied with the city of Hamilton, with what the city of Hamilton is doing in providing and supporting services for the community. This is higher than those who are dissatisfied or very dissatisfied. The service specific questions were revised this year to focus on those who have used the service in the past year. And here's the distribution of those respondents who reported they have not used the service, service or do not know. The service satisfaction ratings that we will see on the next slide exclude these responses. 
So here's the list of all the services and its ratings. There are 29 service areas included in the survey, including police in the libraries. So this is a busy slide, um, but the picture does show um, that there are mainly green here. So that's the good, very good and excellent, and less of the fair and poor in orange and red. The three services most often rated as good, very good, or excellent are fire departments, libraries and bookmobiles, and paramedic services. And to provide a balanced picture, the three services most often rated as poor are community housing, roads and sidewalks, and services for seniors, including long-term care. I would like to note that in some cases, though every effort was made to clarify the service area related to the city by including a service description in the survey, some respondents may associate the question with services provided by other levels of government or community providers. Also, there may be gaps between the service rating by residents, service standards, and the actual performance. These ratings, along with other city data, help to identify communication and knowledge gaps between the city's service performances and the perception of the community. Most of the service ratings did not change significantly compared to the 2019 result. The services that had the greatest change are listed on this slide, which are Hamilton Strait Railway buses, which is a nine point increase from previous result, snow plowing of city owned facilities, eight point increase, social services including Ontario Works, homeless prevention, home management system, health related benefits for low income residents, a seven point decrease, Legislative service and information management, a six point decrease from previous. A new question was added to respond to council's direction to the after action report on COVID-19 pandemic response, which is to understand the public perception on the city's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. More than three out of four respondents rated the city's response as good, very good, or excellent. The next key area is interaction with the city. We continue to see positive assessments of customer experience. The majority of respondents that had contacted the city in the past reported their experience was positive and they felt the city staff were courteous and knowledgeable. Their questions were answered and they received a timely response. This is consistent with the 2019 survey results. Here are some key findings for resident service channel preferences. There have been some notable shifts in the preferred way of connecting with the city. Most respondents prefer the city's website, phone and email services over in-person services. This is mostly consistent with the online results. The service chan uh, channel preferences are as follows. Residents prefer to use phones or email uh, to make complaints, provide feedback or compliment. The top preference to pay property taxes is through their bank. Residents prefer to use the City of Hamilton website to get information, register for programs and services, apply for licenses, licenses and permits, book or rent city facilities or parks and make payments. The topic area where most respondents reported they would like to receive information from the city are updates from uh, updates on what the city is doing or planning to do in the impact in the community. City of Hamilton service changes and updates, resident safety tips and reminders. Events runs or sponsored by the city of Hamilton. Residents have a broad range of preferences for those who, uh, uh, for how they will like to receive information about the city's programs, initiatives, news, and events. The top three methods are email, the City of Hamilton website, and postal mail. The top three methods for the online survey included social media instead of postal mail. And the last key area we have today is on public engagement. 
About one third of the respondents felt the city of Hamilton engages residents in decision making. And we can see on the slide only 3% of the respondents strongly disagreed that the city engages residents in decision making, which is a significant decrease from 2019. We see a similar uh, trend in this question. We have one third of the respondents that agree that the city uses input from the resident and fewer respondents disagreed with the statement compared to previous years. Thanks, Amy. The staff report associated with these results asks that you receive the results and that staff be directed to report back with recommendations on how to improve the RCD survey going forward. We're happy to take any questions you may have. Well, thank you for your presentation. Uh, Lisa Zinkerwich and Amy Tan. Very interesting. And we do have a speaker's list. So we're going to start with uh, Councillor Crutch. Thank you. Uh, for that, um, Chair Pauls, my questions are twofold. One about the methodology, and um, I'm, I'm just deeply concerned about some of the results. And the framing of this presentation was my very first question. I noticed that you chose at some points to display information here in the presentation to council and the public that was about phone only. Um, other places you synthesized that information at phone and internet. Um, or online, other places just online. What was the methodology behind this presentation? I'm trying to understand um, what we're meant to be taking from this because um, you've given us the information but not a qualified opinion about it. Uh, through the chair to the councillor, uh, one of the reasons is with the online survey, as we mentioned in the presentation, it is subject to self-selection bias. And for uh, the best practice, uh, according to the industry uh, practice, that usually for service satisfaction ratings, they rely more heavily on the random sample, and for therefore we did not include those in the presentation today, for the, but for the others that's related to the preference, um, we included for both phone and if I can add to that, we did consult with our public engagement team in terms of how to present the results because we have two very different methodologies that we did undertake the survey through. So in order to make sure that we gave credence to people that participated in both uh, methodologies, that is why you see a little bit of online, a little bit of, of phone, but from a margin of error perspective, that's where we, we primarily focused on the phone results. I ask because I think, and when the recommendations come back, perhaps this can be part of the recommendations report, that we see a, a greater analysis of the anomalies here. So when we talk, I'm talking about anomalies, there's a couple of trends that are occurring. Number one, there's a trend from 2018 to 2022 in terms of how we've done the survey, which is in the report. But two, um, there are all kinds of different anomalies here based on um, the way we gathered the information, right? Like, so if we gathered the information this way or gathered it this way, there's some consistency. And then there's some really big aberrations. So um, there's some where you look at one group and you see, okay, 80% um, satisfaction. Over here you see 50% satisfaction, right? So or close to those numbers. Um, I'm not sure how we're squaring that uh, in terms of our understanding based on, based on the way we're doing this reporting right now. So how are we accounting for those differences? Also, you mentioned earlier, like there's folks who are 65% uh, of people 55 or over when the census is 40%. Like, how are we adjusting for all these different kinds of anomalies and we're reporting this information back? How are we qualifying those? Uh, so through the chair to the councillor, so for the phone survey data, we do require the questions are mandatory to answer for all of them, where we collected the respondent profile by age and ward. So in the phone survey data, we did weigh um, the data, phone survey data, based on those uh, respondent profile to match with the, to have a fair representation of the city of Hamilton population. Right, so I guess my question is more about a synthetic response, right? So what I'm looking for is, is I can, as an individual receiver of the information, I can try and parse all this information out and make various kinds of observations. But a synthetic response that looks at the anomalies will tell me, okay, based on a number of factors here and a number of factors here, right? Um, we, we comfortably could say, this is where we think things lie in this area, or this is where we think things lie in this area, where we see inconsistencies. So that's what I'm asking about. How are we dealing with the, when we have an inconsistency like that, how are we dealing with or addressing that inconsistency so that as a public and council we're able to absorb and understand what, what the direction is or what the feedback is from these groups? So 
From a methodology perspective, you can't actually compare the phone and the online. So I'm not sure if we could ever come to a place where we can say that this is, if you take the phone methodology and you take the online methodology and try to put those together to have a like one common result, I don't think that we can do that from a methodology perspective. But they do give a, a sense of, regardless of the methodology, the trends that we're seeing like so across either methodology are similar regardless of the methodology, but the on online does tend to be consistently lower than the phone survey. Hmm. Okay, um, I guess my last question for now, I'll save my comments for whenever the comments happen, is about table one. You know, it relates to, relates to the construction of this whole thing. In 2018, there were 550 phone surveys conducted. In 2019, there were 5,771 phone surveys conducted, so 10 times the number. In 2022, there was 1,052. If I look at online, same thing, 1,307, jumped to 3,374, and then drops to 2,500, right? Again, I'm trying to understand how that has an impact on this and how that um, shapes the outcome because it, it does. And if we look at most interestingly, the cost of the survey in 2018 was 12,500. In 2019, it was $143,000. But this time around, we only spent 32,000, right? So I'm pointing out that, that I think that has a big role to play in how these results are being displayed and how we're receiving understanding those results, including the platform that was used <laughs> to do these. So how are we looking at all that data in terms of those anomalies when we're receiving this information? Uh, so through the chair to the councillor, um, when we do compare the results between uh, 2022 with the previous years and when we look at the changes, we do perform statistically rep uh, significant tests to account for margin of error and sample size. Um, and to answer your question related to the uh, survey cost, um, the, the survey of uh, margin of error of plus minus 5% and 1,500 was approved uh, according to the previous terms of council direction. Yeah, I'm not concerned about the margin of error. I did not, wasn't asking about the margin of error. I was asking about everything else in the table. So how do, we, how do we understand those things and those inputs in terms of how we have an outcome? I just gonna say, the, the margin of error is very fairly significant in terms of how many surveys that we did and it relates to the cost because in order to reach that margin of error, particularly at the ward level, we had to do a, a number many, many more phone calls to try to reach that margin of error. And that's something that we weren't able to achieve even at the reduced margin of error this year around. Um, in terms of, of the outcome, um, we still have, to have that, that margin of error that we're able to say from a statistically significant perspective that we have that level of confidence in the, in the results. Uh, but that comparison year over year, because those are different, it, it, it does make a difference in terms of the results and how they can be interpreted. But we're just, we're presenting the results as we have them for that year and then just illustrating just general trends. Thanks. Um, I'll just offer that part of, part of a, any survey system is benchmarking, right? And our ability to reflect on the data backwards and forwards. And so um, when we have these different inputs that affect and impact the outcome, it also impacts the benchmarking, right? So I think that, again, when the recommendations come forward, I think an analysis would be helpful in understanding exactly what those impacts are and how we understand those impacts. Um, because right now I don't. And thanks, I'll save Co my comments Counselor, for later. Uh, yeah. Cyrus as an uh, announcer, maybe? Go ahead. Identify yourself. Cyrus Tranny, Chief Digital Officer. Just for some historical context that may be relevant, that may not be clear in the table, the direction for both the cost associated with the survey and the sample sizing came from direction from council uh, approved recommendation reports. So in this case, uh, staff are responsible for administering and carrying out the, uh, the survey itself based on the direction that was received by council with regards to utilization of a phone survey and also the marginal error that was targeted to be received. If that helps, because I can appreciate looking at the table, you're going, why is there such differences in both approach, the quantity of numbers that were received and the cost associated with it. Um, and it's again based on the previous recommendations um, that the council gave direction on. And I think uh, going back to 2019, there was an acknowledgement that it's very challenging to get ward level details uh, at a cost factor. Uh, and it, bringing the survey, council gave us direction to uh, achieve those results that are highlighted in, in 2019. 
2022 table, and even then we struggled uh, with the fact that uh, generally there's been a significant shift, and you can probably attest to it yourself as well as how often people are willing to pill up, pick up a phone to answer questions, uh, which adds another layer of complexity to uh, the administration of the service. Thank you. And I think, uh, Councillor, you have one minute left. So uh, I won't take up. I won't take the whole minute. I'm just going to respond by saying I'm not really terribly concerned why why we're here. I'm concerned about the consequence or the outcome of why we're here. Like, great, Council made that decision. What's the impact, right? So the impact of that decision is this survey, and, and what can we learn from that? And what can we be recommending to Council to say, hey, look, there's a pattern here. We had this outcome based on this input, right? We input this much money into the thing, and we got this outcome. We input this much money into the thing, we got this outcome. What's the difference? What's the impact there? And then make a recommendation back to council saying, this is optimally what we should be doing in this situation because we have quite a spread here. So respectfully, not concerned about the direction it was given, concerned about the outcome. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, Councillor McMickey. Uh, thanks, uh, <coughs> Deputy Mayor. I, I sometimes think uh, we have much, much of our lives between memory and hope. And I think surveys uh, often highlight that uh, reality uh, for us. Um, uh, I saw some interesting trends uh, here. And watch, by the way, congrats on the pandemic side. 77% very pleased. Not personal congrats, congrats to the city. You know, that's a good, good I think, response. But I note the overall uh, sense of accomplishment for the city has dropped. Uh, that 45% um, aren't uh, particularly happy with the services, um, that less than half of those surveyed agree that we're uh, meeting our, our vision, our mission uh, to be the best place to raise a child and the best place for people to age in place. We know statistically, sometimes meeting with statistics are up 17%. Um, Anyhow, that having been, that's, that's, uh, sorry, it's a bad attempt at humor, but uh, um, I, I, I'm also hopeful when I see that uh, when uh, the biggest gap is um, on social service issues, what 33% think it's the most important thing that we ought to be doing, that, uh, that we send, tend to be spending a, a really good amount of time whether it's well spent or not, I'm not quite sure yet, but we're, we're, we'll have to evaluate that too. Um, <clears throat> looking at things like homelessness, code red, poverty, that sort of stuff. I think we really are called uh, to do that. Um, I, I was, uh, I read it twice, and some things I couldn't believe. I couldn't believe that the, the approval rate for snow removal and such was up 7%. <laughs> you know, that's not been my experience, uh, to be frank. Um, in fact, I've had more uh, daggers thrown at, at me as a councillor on snow than any other issue. Um, councillor? Yes, uh, I'm, I'm coming to can a question. Can you ask the question? We're all anticipating the question. Uh, well, I will, and this is all preamble to okay. a the dramatic question. Um, well, you have one minute left. I do. Why, why, the, why the heck do we do this? Why the heck do we do this? Uh, well, how have we treated the results in the past in terms of... Uh, actionable steps and uh, what are we going to do specifically uh, through you through the staff maybe it's part of the discussion what, what are we going to do about the, uh, the the dramatically noted um, results that are in desperate need of improvement those would be my comments and questions thank you uh so why do we do this how have we handled uh, results in the past and uh, what's the intent going forward okay so I'll, I'll start with the last one in terms of the intent going forward and we are going to be coming back with a recommendation report on how to what to do with the our city survey uh, we noted through our presentation that we did experience some um, challenges this time uh, primarily around the use of the phone methodology and, and uh, meeting that council approved margin of error so we want to take a look at it, are we undertaking this survey using the right methodology and uh, what changes can we do to make sure that um, as we go forward with the survey it's giving us the the outcomes that we wanted to, to achieve with that. Um, in terms of why did we start doing the survey itself, so it started back, the first survey was done in 2018, and it was meant to just be a, a like a perception survey, a point in time survey to get a sense of how the community was feeling about um, City of Hamilton services and just a general quality of life information. 
Um, at that time, it, it has evolved each time that we've done it, whether it be from a frequency perspective, whether it be from a margin of error perspective, as well as the types of questions that have been added into the survey. Um, this year, the survey expanded a little bit to ask more questions around uh, communications preferences, added some COVID stuff. Um, so the survey is getting rather long, and um, it, it also is not necessarily the right tool to be asking service level type questions because it provides some very high level information and it's, it's very difficult to action that information because we don't know really what is it telling us. Um, so the, what, how, how has this been used and what is the information for? It does provide us with that kind of little bit of information, a little bit of insight into each of the services that we provide across our organization, but that information has to be supplemented with additional information in order for it to be really valuable to drive continuous improvement activities in those service areas. So that's as part of our review of the R City survey, how we use it, what's its purpose, where do we want it to go? Those are some of the types of things that we're diving deeper in and to make sure that however we evolve the R City survey going forward, that it is something that we're investing in and it's valuable information that we're bringing to the organization that our leaders can then take and use to help in their, the delivery of their services every day. Thank you. Okay, I, I... One, one very quick comment. I, I appreciate the fulsome response. That's important. Um, I, I look forward to a fulsome response to the report. My one last question I noted, uh, I was surprised with the demographics surveyed. Uh, people over 50, I think, were like 60% of the respondents. Younger people were uh, like, depending on age, 2%, 5%, 6%. Um, are we having trouble getting the young people to survey their views? And if we, would it be logical to think that uh, their views might be significantly different? And uh, the views of those, say, over 65, I think 40% of the respondents were over 45. To the chair, to the councillor. Uh, so it is as noted on the slide that we have a smaller representation of a uh, population that are the younger adults. And uh, one of the reasons is the methodology through phone. So the, for the phone survey, we have approximately 60% line, landline and 40% cell phone. And it is because due to this methodology, we have a kind of a skewed uh, representation in the sample where we look at the online results. Um, we have a more representation for the younger adults, and for I would say, depending on the service, uh, depending on the survey questions, as you would note, uh, in the preferred channel of to, uh, con uh, connecting with the city, um, that where we broke up, uh, broke out uh, the results by age group, we do see that there is difference between age groups. Thank you. So we'd be less likely to speak with younger people, homeless. Um, code red folk and anybody without a phone. Uh for the phone methodology, yes, therefore we included the online uh methodology to be inclusive of the population where everyone could access the online results and including uh through the public computers at the Hamilton Libraries. Thank you, Councillor. Uh Councillor Danko, please. Actually, Chair, I don't really have any questions, just a few comments, so uh, I'll, I'll reactivate uh, when we get to the report. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councillor, oh, uh, Maureen Wilson, please. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation and the work. Um, I'm sorry to be so <laughs> simple in my, just two questions. I, I just clearly need to understand um, in your, dis your answers to the questions about uh, working on the survey per se, um, is the survey in your recommendation right now and the results of you have presented, is it in your opinion um, um, in a form and representative enough for the corporation to actually use the results in its deliberations? And then my second question is, um, uh, your work is going to continue to focus on <clears throat> the survey. Maybe my second question is more appropriate for the city manager in that how are we using these results? Thank you. So the, the tenacity, the strength of the survey, mm -hmm. is it in such a form in your opinion that is legitimate uh, to inform our actions? 
going forward? And then how are we using the results in our actions? Thank you. So the second question is a question to the general manager. So can you answer the first question and then maybe we could wait when the report is on the floor? Okay. Thank you. Through the deputy mayor to the councillor. So I would say that, yes, there's a lot of really good information within the survey and, and some of the questions, particularly around the quality of life type questions, um, there's no question around the validity of those uh, th those specific questions as well as, as the results. But um, they, they, they are good snapshot information for us. Are we headed in the right direction? But they're not necessarily going to drive any policy changes. Um, when we start to get into the um, level, like the service level questions, it is great information. It provides a, maybe um, an idea where we should do some deep dives into those service areas, but it's just too high level information for us to draw any specific conclusions on or to drive any specific continuous improvement act activities on that. But having Having said that, there are a whole bunch of other questions around preference on communication channels, um, digital services, access to set types of things, which is, it, which is good information for those service areas to help to identify um, where they should be focusing their, ever, their efforts, how maybe they should be uh, delivering information, what channels they should be using. So it is a mix, but there is some really good valuable information, but definitely an opportunity for us to say, is it giving us um, the outcome that we need across all the questions, and is there other avenues that we can maybe get more valuable? information. Right, thank you. I, I really appreciated that summary. Thank you, thank you Councillor. And you could you want to have another question or do you want to wait till the report is on the floor to ask the question? Second I, question. Yeah, I can wait for the report. Okay. Thank you. So okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Jackson. Well, thanks, uh, Deputy Mayor Pauls, Manager Zinkwich, and uh, Special Project Manager Tan. Thank you for this important information and data. It's good to see that the uh, Jackson traditional letter mail is still very popular, in fact, more <laughs> popular than social media. And that keeps uh, Cup W union employees working as well. And so I'm very pleased to see that, uh, Special <laughs> Project Manager. A couple of questions, Deputy Mayor Pauls. I noticed here on one of your slides, the household incomes, 100,000 and over, seem to get the greatest response. Any comment on that from a social economic standpoint? I'm sure many of my colleagues would nod and say no surprise, but just wondered if staff had any comment on that. Through you, Deputy Mayor Pauls, please. Thank you. Uh, through the chair to uh, the council, uh, the survey methodology, especially for the phone survey, it is completely random. Uh, we do not have a sampling uh, technique uh, to select a specific sample of the population, and for the phone sample, it is completely random. Okay, I'm reading right from your slide. It says household income, 100,000 to 149, 27% uh, respondents, very large, compared to the others, and 150,000 and over. Special Project Manager 10, 29% versus the incomes below 100,000 were uh, very uh, small and pitiful. That's why I was asking if staff had any comment on that, any surprise from that standpoint. Through you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I'm just reading from one of your slides, sorry. Sorry, Deputy, through the Deputy Mayor to the Councillor. Are you looking in one of the appendices or on your actual slide? Appendix B. Okay. Yep, please, Appendix B, my apologies. I think it's page. Yeah. I'm going to so, guess it's page 42. Correct. Is that okay? Fair yep. enough, Lisa? Yep. yep. Through, the, through the deputy mayor to the councillor. So the online survey would be open to anybody to participate. So um, through our robust communications and marketing plan, uh, we, had, had our, we had ads in newspapers, we had um, posters out and stuff. And so the, the online would have been totally self-selected. So we would have had no control over, over that one. Um, but from the, the phone perspective, do you have the phone one? was the random one. So again, Lisa, as you're looking that up further, just, I guess I'm looking for commentary from staff or you're still taking this back as you said, you're gonna report back with the analyses and recommendations, but just curious if staff had any comment, any surprise, and I know in my community, I would say the average income is not 100,000, but I would guess it's probably in the 60, 70, 80 range on an average income. And uh, my community is extremely active on the East Mountain, but I just wondered uh, in terms of household incomes, the Cut. highest uh, respondents, even uh, online doing it themselves, was in the higher bracket incomes. Councillor, uh, yes. Cyrus has an answer for you. 
Well, if the chief <laughs> digital <laughs> officer <laughs> chief. I'm going oh, to that's try. wonderful, please. Answer. I, I think one thing that maybe isn't coming across, first of all, with response to your question, I think the self-selection process for the online definitely uh, gives us a slant and uh, alludes to the fact that we've commented on why they uh, aren't comparable. I think if you look at page 46 of Appendix A, mm -hmm. um, you'll see there's a, a, a better potential distribution for the phone-based survey as it relates to income. But I think what's missing in this discussion, I think Councillor Wilson was also alluding to a little bit, is that, uh, you know, I think there's a, what we've seen through this and in talking with other municipalities is that possibly the use of a phone survey in the current format really isn't potentially meeting the needs of what the city needs in terms of receiving those uh, results. Because, there's, as you staff had mentioned and council has notified, we have a large distribution towards uh, an older population. If you think about logistically about a phone call, who is necessarily maybe has availability or interest in picking up a phone? I know a lot of us just ignore the phone when it calls at, at dinner time. So we have a skewed result as a base to population. Potentially, um, you know, the online definitely, and even with the phone-based survey. And I think that's another reason why staff did not want to bring a recommendation forward with regards to moving forward on the next steps for our city survey is to hear this type of feedback so that when we bring the recommendation around what is the next evolution of our city survey, some of these types of concerns that have been raised by council and are appearing in the population shift to propensity to take phone surveys, et cetera, and accessibility to online can be incorporated into the recommendation going forward for a more uh, enhanced approach uh, and conciseness around how we want to deliver the next iteration of the survey with council's approval. Okay, okay. Chief uh, CDO uh, Tarani, I'll accept that for now. Appreciate the explanation. Last question. Um, to the manager or special projects manager. Perception of city uses input from residents' decision making. It was 32% believe it is, 33% said no. I'm curious, was that broken down into people who delegated here, either virtually or in person? Was that just through city center and the, res and the response they got? Uh, was that through uh, members of council's offices and feedback? I'm just curious if that was broken down at all. Through you, Deputy Mayor Pauls, and that's my last question. Thank you. So to the chair, to the council, so there was, uh, the information was not broken down. There was a mm -hmm. high level understanding of uh, public's perception on engagement. Interesting, okay, thank you very much. Thank you, and we have uh, Councillor Francis. Thank you, and uh, through you, Deputy Mayor Pauls, and thanks for this uh, wonderful presentation. I'm sure this was a lot of work to get this survey together. I just wanna bring your attention to slide 21, um, the rating of city services. I, I see the police are quite highly rated by residents of Hamilton, which is interesting based on some of the noise that's out there. Mm -hmm. uh, did you get a sense of why Hamiltonians are so satisfied with the police service here? Uh, through the chair to the council. Um, the survey does not bro uh, broken down into details of answering why the ratings were rated in this way. Um, but in the 2022 uh, survey results, the police was very consistent with the previous iterations of the survey uh, in uh, 2019 and 18. Thank you. Thank you, that's all I have. Thank, thank, you. thank you, thank you. Councillor Francis, Councillor Clark. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Can I ask, who does the survey? Are you talking about our vendor? Sorry, do the Deputy Mayor. Who's doing the survey for us? Oh. Is it staff? The, so internal to, to that, so the survey development, the planning around the survey and the analysis is done internally by staff. We have a third party. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you uh, please speak louder and- uh, That wasn't the issue. Yeah. Well, sorry, through the, through the deputy mayor to the councillor. Internally, we have a staff person, Amy is the primary lead that does the planning, the analysis, and uh, the report, like prepares the report. We do uh, work through our procurement to, with an RFP, I believe we did. Uh, um, RFQ? RFQ to do, uh, put it out there to market and we have a vendor that does the independent uh, calling. And the online survey is an outside vendor doing that also for us, or do we do that? No, so we prepare the survey similar to we do uh, for the phone survey, and then we put it through our Engage Hamilton website. 
make it available through there. And then our communications staff helps us with the marketing and promotion. The phone survey, it looks or it appears to me that there are 25 questions being asked. Is, does every respondent get asked 25 questions? So to the chair, uh, through the chair to the councillor, yes, for the phone survey um, that we do ask the respondent uh, the whole uh, survey questions. Do you have any indication in your results how many respondents on the phone question just said, yep, I got to go and just stop the interview and hung up? Uh, I apologize. We do not collect that information from the third party vendor. Councillor? I'm curious how long it takes the vendor to ask 25 questions of someone on the telephone. So the average uh, survey length by phone is around 25 minutes. Oh. It is a longer, more a longer uh, comprehensive survey. I would take 25. <laughs> Councillor. And so the vendor doesn't provide how many people say, yeah, this is too long, I'm hang I'm, I got to go. Uh, is so there a way of us finding out? So, so uh, in this iteration of the survey, um, this request was not included in the RFQ as the purpose of uh, the work was to collect response from the public, uh, complete the response from the public. Um, but the vendor did mention that they um, had a difficult time reaching to the public to answer their phones. And if a respondent does not finish the survey, is that survey included in the results? Uh, so for the phone's results, it is uh, all the completed surveys that, um, are presented here and does not include partial completion. And we do not have the data uh, for the partial completion, the completed surveys. Thank you. And the rest of my questions will be Th for staff. Thank you. Uh, can I pass the chair to... Councillor Clark, I have a couple of questions. Go ahead. Um, I agreed, I took the survey, and it did take a long time, and uh, I would never do a survey for 25 minutes on the phone, first of all. Even online, I took, uh, it took a long time. But my question is this. I looked at top, uh, slide 17, top of my priorities. If you look at that, it says social issue, parks, activities, and recreation, investment cleanup on the city, city work principles, safety, policing, infrastructure, transit, road, school, education. It lists everything. That should tell us what the whole survey is all about. And interesting, you look at the bottom and look what it says. Environment and climate change, 1%. I was shocked. I really was, because that's all we've been talking about is climate change. I look at the top of my priorities, and really the survey, if you look at that, that embeds on the whole survey. I did the survey, and I thought, this is ridiculous. And when I'm, how do I feel here? How would I feel there? But if you look top of the mind priority, that should tell us what we need to fix. A am I wrong? Like, I, I, I just look at that, you know, a transit, roads, school, you know, safety, policing. So it, it just, it, there's something amiss here that I don't understand why we're asking. How many questions were online? There were tons. How many? Can you tell me? There were 26 and 26. And even going and um, doing, you know, if, and, and I have a computer and I had a little bit of time. I cannot imagine people that are um, social issues with people, homeless people, or people that don't have resources, don't have computers, don't have phones, could ever answer this. But this survey, top of the mind priority, should be the only question. And it's broken down. And I think uh, next time, uh, do you have any comment on that? 
through or? Yeah. So th through the deputy mayor to the councillor, you have an upcoming council priorities workshop happening this Friday. Right. Um, I'm happy to know that we, or let you know that we've shared the preliminary res results of that specific question. This is the only open-ended question available on the survey with the planning team, and it has been rolled into the discussion that you'll have on Friday to help set your priorities. Thank you. It would be, uh, and I looked at Ward 7, there were 9% of people that answered was one of the highest. I do have more population there, but, uh, but to me, we have to do it well. If we're going to do a survey, if we're going to spend money, let's do it well so we understand what people are really asking for us to do not just random 25 question councillor clark when you, they when you asked that question i was shocked on the phone 25 question i don't think anybody would do 25 minutes on the phone so thank you and i'll take the chair back all right okay so we need a mover and a seconder to carry uh, to Councillor Spadafora, Councillor Alex Wilson, thank you, and we'll vote. Thank you. All right, now we're going to go, oh, sorry. 14-0, <laughs> zero. thank you. Uh, on the report, may I please have a mover and a seconder to put the report on the floor? Councillor Beatty and Councillor Jackson, thank you. And uh, Evo for uh, putting it on the floor. Oh, we don't, okay. Okay, first let's do the discussion and then we'll vote. Um, okay. Okay, Councillor Clark. Oh, he did. You got, that is so nice. Don't we get along so well? Well, we do on this side of the room, anyways. I just... that, come on. Okay, Councillor Danko. Thank you. Actually, I, I don't have any questions. Just a couple comments of uh, things that came to mind reviewing the report. Uh, First of all, I really appreciate the work done by our staff to give us um, some insight that is perhaps outside of the bubble of council, of the bubble of social media, of uh, you know just our, our personal um, you know correspondence with with residents to get a, a bigger sense of you know perception throughout the city. So I I really do appreciate the work uh, that's went into that. I'm definitely going to dig into it a bit more um, in terms of uh, priorities for Ward Eight and what we can do. But just a couple things that came to mind. Interesting in the, the top of mind priorities, I think if you break down the social services group was sort of a group of, of issues that really the top, top of mind priority was no comment. Mm -hmm. And I think to me anyway, that is kind of a message that as a city, as a council, uh, we do need to do a better job of engaging with residents to have them more um, knowledgeable and more, um, involved in the decision-making process. So that, that's just a takeaway that I get um, from that uh, survey result. I think the, the difference between the online survey and the phone survey is really interesting as well because as was mentioned, the online is self-selected. And it, I think it, to a certain extent anyway, really reflects the doom and gloom of social media where everything is awful and it's, you know, people are self-selecting to complain. and. I think a lot of times in our role as counselors, that's, that's the response that we hear on a daily basis from residents as well. And it's not necessarily the whole community, um, you know, their perception of, of what's actually going on. Uh, the COVID-19 response, I think that was already highlighted, but uh, just really interesting that 76% uh, view the city's COVID response as good, very good or excellent with only 9% being poor. And I think, Again, you know, that's kind of consistent with the overall population uh, response to COVID and vaccinations and things like that. Um, customer experience, I think that was another one that really stood out for me that 87% um, see the city's uh, customer experience being knowledgeable, 75% had their questions answered, 74% received a timely response. 
Um, just, you know, from our experience in the Ward 8 office, I mean, that's mostly a lot of the, the feedback that we get from residents, but, you know, to hear it from the general public is it, quite different than what we hear on a daily basis. Um, the quality of life as well, I, I think, you know, overall still positive, but definitely some work to do there. It's really important to get that feedback. Another interesting one is that most people, as Councillor Jackson pointed out, most people still prefer uh, traditional sources of information. Um, and at the same time, their interactions with the city are almost exclusively preferred to be online and digital. So that's a bit of a, a disconnect there between how people receive their information and then how they interact with, with the city. And you know, discussions about having auxiliary offices in, in, uh, in the amalgamated suburbs and stuff and maintaining the cost of those offices, is that really necessary when we're seeing that people's actual preference is online, not in person? And then last is, um, you know, a couple of the, the rating of city services that stood out. Uh, the roads, sideways, si sorry, roads, sidewalks, roadway safety uh, stood out as having lower ratings. That's definitely consistent with what we hear from residents. But as Councillor um, Francis pointed out, the perception of police services is quite the opposite of what we hear um, you know, from mm -hmm. some of the delegations and, and uh, organized campaigns that, uh, that come our way from time to time, that 79% see police services as good or above, and actually even highlighted increased and better policing um, as a priority. So, you know, again, just, you know, going back to the beginning of having some broader perspectives from the community, I think that's one as a council that uh, we definitely need to take away and, and um, you know, when these issues come up, consider that broader perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Clark. Thank you. If I could ask just a couple of questions of our senior leadership team. So when I'm looking at the way these surveys have been run for the last few years, in my mind, they seem to be Situa situational in nature. What I'm saying is if they ask a survey directly after the Shadok Creek thing became public as to how the city is performing environmentally, I think the response would have been dramatically no. If they ask the survey right after a large police budget increase of 20%, I don't think they'd be supporting the police. And so I guess I'm trying to figure out how do we account for situation, situational bias that naturally occurs based on when the surveys are being asked or the months that it are being asked. How do we balance that survey result given that at any particular time it's a Polaroid snapshot and, and it can reflect poorly or positively? If taxes went down one year, miraculously 5%, everybody would love the city. There seems to be that potential implication with the surveys. And so I'm, I'm trying to make sure that we're getting best value out of these surveys. Thank you. City manager. Um, through the uh, deputy mayor to council. So, the councillor's quite right. Whether it's our staff employee engagement survey or whether it's a survey of the public, it is taken in a moment of time. And you have to understand as you're analyzing the results, what was the context, what was happening in the city, on the, the media, et cetera, at the time. And, and that's where I think, as we go back and look at where this survey goes for the future, and all municipalities are doing this because, you know, the world has changed in terms of how to do surveys, is are you better to do shorter 
for lack of a better word, pulse surveys that are done, um, a smaller group, randomized through a series of times over the year where context is different. And I'll pass it on over to um, Cyrus Tarani and uh, maybe Amy if she has some further um, explanation because she's much bigger into a methodology expertise than, than I am. But you definitely cannot ignore what is happening in the moment in time when the survey was done. I'll pass it over to Cyrus. Uh. Thank you, City Manager Jeanette. I, I think that the type of discussions that we're having with council is, is really valuable because that's why we specifically, and I sound like a broken record, chose not to bring recommendations forward around the next iteration. And I think, you know, it's, it's in the report, and it may not have come through in the presentation, but some of the questions that are being asked uh, today and staff are asking about the evolution of the survey, we're hearing it from other municipalities. You know, the challenges around, and I don't want to sound, again, like a broken record, the challenges around using phone as a methodology to conduct surveys and people's willingness to participate, the length of the survey, what is the intent in terms as it relates to getting a pulse on key uh, considerations? For example, council has just recently knocked on every single door in the city and has a fairly good pulse of what those issues and priorities are. But as we go forward, how can this potentially act as augmented point in time informed survey content that is useful uh, to both council uh, and city staff? And we're seeing those same types of being discussions of how to effectively ensure a city survey is meaningful being asked by the other municipalities that we engage with, so we're not the only ones struggling, if that gives some comfort, to figure out how to make this work better. And that's going to be the intent of the recommendations coming forward, is to synthesize both the comments around the table today, as well as what we're hearing from our municipal colleagues that are also struggling with this, these issues around point in time, uh, large, singular focus city surveys, and help that inform decisions going forward. I'll pass it over to uh, Amy if she wants to add anything else uh, from her her uh, engagement and expertise that she's done in looking at, along with Lisa, as to how this can evolve to better serve our city needs. Amy? If I may just also add, uh, from our conversation with other municipalities as well as other vendors who conduct uh, the uh, surveys, that we do see a trend of uh, moving to the shorter pause survey to get more feedback from the residents on a more frequent basis. And also in terms of survey methodology, so we are not the only one who's having challenge of uh, getting responses uh, through the phone method. And um, if I may just reference to uh, one of the bigger surveys uh, companies such as Ipsos Read, um, so they also are moving towards the online survey and then they use something called the credibility intervals instead of the classical margin of error um, to obtain more uh, scientific results. And this is something that we are uh, all exploring for our recommendation. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Councillor Clark? Uh, and I, I'm not necessarily sold on uh, moving to an online uh, type of survey because that is also prone to uh, potential um, almost weaponization uh, that, that individuals will be aware of this and, and encourage uh, thousands of followers to go and complete these surveys and, and that doesn't necessarily give us a real observation as to the performance of the municipality. Has the staff considered, Deputy Mayor, uh, smaller survey questions, perhaps every third person who's calling into the city line or something like that, or offering, would you like to complete a survey when we're done with this? And if they say yes, they push a button and it kicks over to an automated survey. Have we contemplated that type of ongoing survey, which at least in, in my mindset seems to assist us uh, by avoiding situational bias? Uh, Lisa? Yeah. 
So through the deputy mayor to the councillor. So that is something that we're considering. Um, we're also looking at the number of different surveys that are happening across the organization for all various different needs. There, there is a little bit of sense of survey fatigue out there. So we want to make sure that if we're asking the question, we know what we're asking that, why we're asking that question and how we're going to be using that question. And there may be different surveys or types of surveys that are more applicable to different types of services or different types of questions, depending on what that outcome is that we're trying to achieve. So working with our public engagement folks and the design of the policy and uh, public engagement framework that's coming out, we're also coordinating and, and looking at how to integrate the R-City survey with other potential surveys that have to happen, whether it be from a legislative perspective, such as some of the asset management services or surveys that are required that are really diving into levels of service type of questions. Um, so we're, we're really taking a broad look at how do we engage with the public, the whole surveys when we're asking uh, what type of questions we're asking, what methodology are we using when, and when is the most appropriate time to use what type of methodology and what type of question. Thank you. Councillor? And my last question is, we've been doing this for three, maybe four years now. What have we done that has improved the situation for residents based on the results of these surveys? What improvement has come out of the survey questions. Anybody like to, oh, manager? Uh, through the um, deputy mayor. So in my time here, I would say how we've most used the results is in, from the communications perspective in terms of how we're communicating to residents to get information out, recognizing different demographics, look for their information different ways, et cetera. And I, because I do think that's one of the, the biggest areas and I'll pass it over to Director Grant to expand on that. Uh, thank you. Through the chair, two members of council, that is correct. So. Uh, in this iteration of the survey, we also added another question of what kinds of information people like to receive. And so with the types of information that people like to receive, with the uh, method of delivery, so um, you know, email, websites, uh, mainstream media, and then broken down by age demographic, it will help us further tailor the type of information that we're delivering and the specific channels we're using to reach target audiences. So for us, um, we found uh, this particular survey is particularly helpful, particularly when we measure it against our, um, our performance analytics of each communications piece individually. Okay, separate from communications, how does it help us operationally? Where have we improved anything operationally as a result of the feedback provided to us from the survey? Uh, the city manager wanted to respond to that. Um, through the um, through the mayor to council. So I would say that, and any of the GMs can jump in if they'd like, that this survey alone wouldn't, as that moment in time survey, it would be a piece of information that goes into. Um, a review of a program. So what are we hearing from our survey? How are we doing with benchmarking with other municipalities? Um, what, how is the, the feedback we're getting directly from our clients when we give the survey? So it would be part of that um, collection of information when we're making decisions. It's one piece. This survey alone wouldn't cause, in, in the general service area, um, you know, a major revolutionary change in the service. It would be another data point with other data points that they have to assist with decision making going forward. What this survey can also do, if we're seeing trends that over a three year survey period that it's going down, down in one area, then that's an area that it directs us to, okay, we've got to lean in and do a deeper dive to understand why is this going down? It's not in other municipalities, so what's different here? And so it, it can be that um, uh, red light, so to speak, that tells us we've got to focus in on an area. Councilor Clerk? And have we had any of those deep dives in the last three years? City Manager? 
through the chair, I would say in the last three years, most of our focus has been the pandemic. I mean, truly that's where most of our efforts uh, have been thrown and against. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why when we brought the evaluation of the pandemic forward, um, the piece we were missing is what did the public think? Um, and so at least, you know, we were able to add the question, the survey to round out our review of the pandemic to do that. But I would say specifically in the last three years, um, I can't point to a specific one except for in communications because just it was all hands on deck for the pandemic. And I guess that's the challenge that I have, Mayor, we've been doing this for quite a, a, a little while now. And in reviewing my notes, I can't see anything that we have changed. We keep asking questions. We get a general response, love the police, hate the police. Um, but we don't do anything with it because we really don't know what they mean by the statement. I mean, you know, I think you're doing a great job or what's the what's the qualifier and and i'm not seeing the value of this type of survey other than to be able to say well 67% of the people think we're doing a good job that's not helping us as a municipality improve our service to our constituents if we truly don't understand where we are failing them as governors, and that's what I'm wrestling with. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Uh, Councillor Maureen Wilson, please. I pre uh, thank you, Mayor Horvath. I appreciate Councillor Clark's question. Um, that was my question. Uh, how are we, what are we doing with this? How are we, what's our intention? on informing how we do um, the city's work. And I appreciate the city manager's answer. Um, I guess uh, this is just more of a comment. I'm really, um, I think embedded in some of this or all of this is also the issue of trust and confidence which I think all institutions are struggling with in the Western world, at least. Um, I'm very mindful that social issues are top of mind for many people, but I'm also a little nervous um, in, and I don't mean this in the wrong way, but in fixating on communication, um, in my opinion, uh, these social issues are creating considerable local tensions in our neighborhoods. Um, and uh, I think we have to do a, a better job of um, not just communicating what we're doing, um, but what's going on um, and explaining the complexity of the, of the issues. Um, because otherwise, uh, the void will be filled with um, voices that are pushing easy answers uh, that don't solve anybody's interests, particularly those who are on the not great end of the social issues. So that's just my, like, I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, I think surveys are great as long as we um, can um, actually use them. Um, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to, now that, uh, I hope that we'll be able to pivot in that uh, direction. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Kretsch. Thanks, I don't have any questions, um, just comments as well. Um, I don't think this is very effective. We heard today that there's a phone survey and there's an online survey. And then we're getting these things all jumbled together in, in one kind of answer. And, but we can't compare them, but we are. Um, it's hard. You look at statistics from the phone survey saying 79% are happy with police services. You look at the online services, 53%. Twice as many people respond online as responded by phone. What do we make of that? Inconclusive. And so I kind of think, okay, 
um, not helpful. There's also this like tremendous fear around the internet, which I just want to just clock for everybody here. Like people on the internet are completing an online survey. That's okay too. They have opinions. They're real. They're okay. Just like the people on the phone answering the questions, same opinions. Their opinions are valid. So if we're not reaching a wide enough audience, if we don't feel like we're reaching a wide enough audience, right? However we're reaching them, that's a problem. But how we're reaching them, I just wish we destigmatize that a bit. You know, social media is not scary, <laughs> or maybe it is. But the point is, like, continue to comment on it, like, oh, someone who responds on social media is responding with a certain motivation. It's just not helping the conversation in any way. Um, so I think it's important for us to think about, instead of that, think about are we reaching everybody we need to reach? And the answer is obviously not. Things like the context, I think, are so important. Let me say it again. <laughs> the context is so important. We've been doing this for five years now, since 2018, right? This particular style of survey. Things like time of day, when in the year, length of survey, media contact, style of survey, Councillor Paul's point earlier, uh, online survey or not, uh, all these kinds of things have an impact. And without that context for us to understand, um, the story around how we interpret this, it's not useful for us, I think, in this format. So I hope the recommendation coming back says, here's what we can do to provide you with the feedback from the public that's gonna help you make decisions to Councillor Clark's point, or Councillor whoever it was, I think it was you, Councillor Clark, about operational questions, right? Like, what are we doing to increase, um, how are we showing a direct link between these survey results and improve services to the public? Like a direct link. And if we're not doing that, then let's not do it. Um, I see, I have seen other surveys other cities are doing and they do them, do, do them in different ways. I'm not a data scientist also. Just saying, from sitting in a chair as a counselor, looking at this information and being told variously, can't, can't account for that, can't account for that, can't account for that, I ask myself, what are we accounting for? Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Tattison, please. I just want to remind council and staff, and uh, I'd like to I'd like to hearken back to something that the delegate David Braden said that I think would be of the utmost importance to consider here. He said, "Service at the counter is vitally important." What I take from that is that service at the counter is critical to good gov to good governance. And whether that takes place across the counter at City Hall down here or in a municipal building across the table when you're engaging with your constituents in a rural setting, I think it's vitally important that that's the way that we communicate with our, staff, with our residents through that personal dialogue. The things that happen not just at City Hall but in a municipal center where you can serve people where it's convenient for them to get to and come and deliver a message. So I'd just like to address the underlying current that sometimes comes across from certain delegates and, and, and counselors that we need to consider the service that we give the people on a personal level is the most important thing and whatever we can do to make that as easy for them to reach out to us we should be doing that. And those are my messages. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Megan, you're on the speaker's list. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, thank you. No, 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 never. It's just uh, <laughs> we're having a conversation about, uh, about the mission statement of the city and when it was set up. And uh, I read it at the bottom of every page of every yeah. document. Uh, you know, let me, let me just go to it directly, because yeah, it ties to the kinds of questions that you're asking about, how do we make the connection between what we're learning and what we're doing? And uh, Councillor Clark says two observations about, uh, show me the beef, I guess, was the, would be the colloquial way of putting it, but it says, our vision to be the best place to raise a child and age successfully. Now, when was that established as the vision for the city? Can somebody tell me that? Oh, Councillor Clark. Uh, Two terms back. Oh, oh. So, so how we do? How we doing on that? Who do you want to ask? Well, anybody who's got a, 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 a brilliant answer would be help, uh, start. Manager. Um, but let, let me preface. If I, if I'm correct, 
41% of the people who live below the poverty line are children in our city are children under the age of 14. And 20%, according to the code red, which uh, some of our councillors quote, uh, um, uh, thankfully, I want every once in a while, and they make the point about, you know, who responds, you know, may drive what we're, we think we're hearing and what we think we need to do. 20% of the people in our, our city live on average 21% less than the rest rest of us. Aging in place doesn't sound like we're... So anyhow, how, how, how are we doing on that? Are we measuring that? That's our, that's our key vision. That's our key mission. That's it. That's all I got to say. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. All right. Do we have a mover and a seconder? I think we do. And we're going to vote. It's to receive. No, we have to e vote. No? no. Uh, to the deputy mayor, this is on the report recommendation. Okay. So it's to approve the recommendations. Right. Uh, yes, absolutely. Everybody see it? Do you want it? It's right there. Do you want me to read it or do you, everybody's okay? Councillor Clark. So this assumes that we're just going forward with the same methodology. Uh, do you want it? Add, take away, what would you like? I'm asking of staff. Oh. General Manager? Yep. Uh, through, the, through the Deputy Mayor, no. What this says is, based on all the, the questions, concerns, challenges with doing phone surveys in this uh, evolution of society, um, we would come back to make recommendations to council about, you know, does this survey continue at all? Are there other ways to get input from our citizenry to improve our services? Those broad questions. And so if I'm reading this correctly, we're not gonna hear about this until shortly before the budget process. Is there any way of getting that, those recommendations expedited sooner so that if we do wanna make changes, we have the time frame to make changes? Uh, Cyrus. Thank you. Through you, Madam Chair, to Councillor Clark. Uh, staff intent is for um, early in Q3 to bring back some of these recommendations, sorry, June, like June, July-ish period. We've already started the engagement process and trying to understand what are some of the options, both to the vendors and what other municipalities are, are doing. Uh, but I think uh, part of that would be the way the previous funding for this work uh, was done. It needs to be brought back to council to identify how it should be funded. So it's, I guess, short version to your question is the intent is to bring it back sooner than the start of the budget process to inform what the next iteration and approach to the survey methodology um, that meets council's approval um, will be. So targeting June or July uh, of this year to come back with that recommendation. Councillor Clark. Can we include that, Deputy Mayor, in that recommendation that they'd be coming back in June or July of this year? And the only reason I'm asking is that I heard and I can sense some trepidation about where we're going with this process and our concerns about what it's really meaning and is there any true value to what we're undertaking in this process mm -hmm. in terms of actually improving services. So if we get it back in June or July, we can have that discussion well before the budget process. That would be my suggestion. That's great, and it's put in in July or uh, June or July 2023, prior to the 2024 budget process. All right, uh, Mayor Horvath, please. 
Uh, thanks, and I, I thank uh, Councillor Clark for uh, for that amendment. I'll, I'm supportive of that uh, direction. But there's been a couple of things said about the efficacy or the the value of various kinds of um, uh, solicitation of information or surveys or whatever you will. Um, and I've had a little bit of experience in terms of polling over the years. Um, and there are there are challenges to the different methodologies and, and challenges to uh, who it is that's engaged in any of the possible ways to contact people. And so that includes telephone, that includes online, that includes all, all pieces. And I think for us to actually be able to understand um, clearly how, I, I think some of us have different understandings than others around what some of, the, some of that means. And if we're gonna continue to do digital, whether it's surveys, continue with our digital process, uh, I think we really need to have a, a better sense as a council from coming from one kind of space uh, in terms of understanding and knowledge as to how these, uh, these things work. And I would just, I think well, I would just ask that that is part of the, the conversation going forward. It may be that that has been done with the previous council. I don't know, uh, but certainly it seems to me, listening to the conversation, that there's a like there's certainly a difference in in what people's experiences, what their knowledge is, what their understanding is of the various methodologies. And so, if we could have that, um, so that we're all kind of on the same page in terms of uh, what we're talking about here, that would really be helpful. Thank you. Well said. Any other speakers before we uh, receive and we vote? I don't see any. So, so if we can have a vote on the amendment first and yes. then the report recommendations as amended. So, so the so amendments up if if that's okay, Deputy Mayor. This is the amendment. Okay. Councillor Francis, are you able to vote? Councillor Francis, did you vote? Okay. Anybody else? No? And it carried. Okay. And then on the report as amended. On the report itself now? Thank you. Okay, we're moving along. And that carries 15-0. Okay, we're moving on to 8-2, Better Home Hamilton, Home Energy Retrofit Program. Trevor Info, Senior Project Manager, will start the presentation for item 8-2 and introduce an external consultant, Nico Strabeck. Thank you. Introduce yourself, Linda. Linda? Yes. Put your mic on and... Thank you. Um, just very briefly, um, I'm Linda Lukasik, the director of the Office of Climate Change Initiatives, and very quickly I just want to introduce Trevor and the team. And I just want to say that today is a really exciting day for the Office of Climate Change Initiatives. We're here on the heels of our April 5th delegation to you with our 2023 priorities, with detailed information about a pathway forward to operationalizing one of those priorities, the Home Energy Retrofit Opportunity. Um, so we know that greenhouse gas emissions from buildings need to be addressed and we know that building retrofits are the way to achieve this. We also know that we have no time to waste. This is a climate emergency and this pilot is really an important step in the right direction. So I'm going to quickly now hand it over to Trevor Imhoff. Trevor is a senior project manager in the Office of Climate Change Initiatives. He's here today with Nico Strabak from the Mohawk Centre for Climate Change Management and Kate Flynn as well from the Mohawk Centre for Climate Change um, Initiatives Management. And they're going to share an overview of the pilot in more detail and you'll have lots of opportunity to ask questions. So over to you, Trevor and Nico. Thank you. Thank you so much, Director Lukasik. Through you, Deputy Mayor, to members of the General Issues Committee and to members of the public, 
It is my extreme pleasure to be here today to present the Better Homes Hamilton program. As Dr. Lukasik mentioned, I am here and joined by Kate Flynn, the general manager of the Center for Climate Change Management. As an applied research institute at Mohawk College, focusing on collaborative, uh, cl collaborating with industry, government, and community to implement climate change solutions. Joining Kate and myself is Nico Strabek, who is the project lead for this initiative and who I have had the pleasure working with to develop the Better Homes Hamilton program. I would now like to hand uh, things over to Nico Strabek to go over the research, the engagement completed, and how that has been used to inform the key elements of the program, including the recommendations. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you so much, Trevor. Good afternoon, everyone, through you, Deputy Mayor, to members of the General, General Issues Committee, city staff, and members of the public. As Trevor mentioned, my name is Nico Strabak. I'm a project lead within the Center for Climate Change Management, or CCCM, as I'll be shortening it to, at Mohawk College. Over the last year, I have had the privilege to work with the city on the development of Hamilton's first residential retrofit program, previously called the Home Energy Retrofit Opportunity, or HERO program, is now proposed and referred to as the Better Homes Hamilton program. Oops. Um, yes, I, sorry, I may have clicked off it. Ah, I see. Perfect. All right, thank you, and sorry about that. Um, I'd like to begin the presentation by providing GIC with some background information about the inception of the Better Homes Hamilton program. Direction to undertake the development of a home energy retrofit opportunity or HERO program was provided by Council during the General Issues Committee meeting on May 19th, back in 2021. Councillors were clear that this program needed to be both flexible enough to enable participation from the greatest number of Hamiltonians, as well as impactful enough to, re to substantially reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Following this direction from Council, City staff successfully obtained funding from the Federation of Canadian Municipalities through their Green Municipal Fund Study Design Grant to support program design activities. The Center for Climate Change Management was then contracted to lead the development of the Better Homes Hamilton program and implementation plan with direction to consult with notable long-serving environmental NGOs such as Environment Hamilton and Green Venture, as well as interdisciplinary entities such as the Bay Area Climate Change Council. As an applied research institution, employing an evidence-based decision-making framework came naturally to the CCCM. We began by asking ourselves, what are other successful programs doing? To answer this question, the design of over a dozen residential energy efficiency retrofit programs were examined. To gather as many insights and best practices as possible, the CCCM did not only examine programs found within Ontario, but also across the country, as well as examining in detail several programs throughout North America and Europe. Significant efforts were made to understand the parameters of each, each program, namely the eligibility requirements, the eligible expenses, the rebates and incentives held therein, as well as common hurdles experienced by both the program coordinators as well as the participants. Simply put, we wanted to take inspiration from what worked well with other programs and simply leave out things which we deemed as hindrances to program success. Next, the CCCM sought um, to, un to understand how these desirable practices gleaned from our research could be applied to a retrofit program within the city of Hamilton. To answer this question, over 40 community and regional stakeholders were engaged through a combination of interviews and feedback sessions, oftentimes returning from multiple sessions with stakeholders. Finally, while ongoing stakeholder consultation was occurring, the CCCM sought to understand public perceptions surrounding energy retrofits. To accomplish this, Deloitte was contracted to administer a mixed format survey with responses being collected both online and via telesurvey, which was sampled representatively from across all wards. The survey found that there is broad support for an energy retrofit program, which assists homeowners in creating more environmentally friendly, energy efficient homes. Notably, 90% of respondents agreed that a retrofit program would be beneficial to the community, while 82% of respondents indicated they would be more likely to participate in the program if they had access to coaching services. These coaching services would advise on a variety of issues, including project management, explain various retrofits and their efficacy, as well as assisting in the identification of rebates that participants may be able to access. 
In order to better understand Hamilton's building stock, the CCCM examined 2021 census data across various dwelling types. Census data suggested that at this point, 75% of dwellings found within Hamilton would be eligible for the program as proposed. Hamilton uh, has a significant amount of uh, single detached structures. We found that 56% of structures within the city can be uh, labeled as such. Uh, so this led us to infer that there is you know, am ample uh, building stock to support a comprehensive retrofit program within our city. These results were verified through an energy data analysis commissioned from LightSpark Software Inc., which mapped eligible building types by forward sortation area. LightSpark identified seven building archetypes, uh, which were defined by building characteristics, energy consumption, and annual GHG emissions profiles. Through the FCM funding, we were able to hire a student researcher who overlaid our census data collected with energy expense data made publicly available uh, from the Canadian Urban Sustainability Practitioners Group, also called CUSP. They have a very interesting energy mapping uh, toolkit. According to CUSP, 25% of Hamiltonians have a high energy burden. This is defined as paying more than 6% of after-tax income on home energy expenses. Furthermore, Data suggests that 41% of Hamiltonians pay more than the national average of 3% after-tax income on home energy expenses. Through the research conducted by our student, we, ex we determined high energy burden is a city-wide problem, prevalent in both urban and rural settings. The research and maps generated by the student researcher have been passed over to the Office of Climate Change Initiatives to aid in informed, targeted outreach and communications. Having completed the, this volume of research, the CCCM distilled five gui key, key guiding principles to inform program design. First, it is paramount that any residential retrofit program align with the Hamilton Climate Action Strategy, specifically low carbon transformation two, transforming our buildings, which can be found within the Community Energy and Emissions Plan. Next, we sought to design a program that would be accessible to the greatest number of Hamiltonians, which would assist them in reducing their greenhouse gas emissions from their homes while increasing home comfort, air quality, and energy efficiency. Significant efforts were made to reduce administrative lag and financial barriers in the process wherever possible. Building upon that train of thought, the CCCM reviewed the eligibility requirements of existing rebate and incentive programs in depth. A core principle of an accessible retrofit program is the ability to complement and stack with existing external initiatives and incentives. As designed, participants in the BHH program are able to undertake retrofits which unlock a number of rebates, including those found in the Government of Canada Greener Home Grant, as well as Enbridge Gas's Home Efficiency Rebate Plus program, henceforth referred to as a HER Plus program throughout this presentation. The stackability we demonstrated more in a few moments. And finally, drawing inspiration from other successful programs, as well as the responses from the public engagement survey we conducted, the CCCM views the need to provide energy coaching services as critical to program success. Oftentimes, homeowners have little to no knowledge of building science or what it entails to undertake a home energy retrofit. They also may be intimidated by the retrofit process. An energy coach would help to digest EnerGuide recommended upgrade reports, assist homeowners in choosing the right retrofit for their goals, as well as provide guidance on project management and how to access applicable rebates. Now, having explained our research process and guiding principles, it is my pleasure to introduce the Better Homes Hamilton program. I'd like to take a few moments and walk you through the key features of the Better Homes Hamilton program. At its core, you can think of the BHH program as an initiative which offers fixed rate, low income loans issued by the municipality in order to finance a set list of eligible upgrades which improve energy efficiency and reduce greenhouse gas emissions from residential dwellings. The recommended financial mechanism is a local improvement charge or LIC framework. Under this model, the municipality is permitted to issue loans to finance energy efficiency improvements on private properties, as well as recover the balance of loans via property tax payments. The mechanism is supported under provincial law drafted in 2012 by the province of Ontario and is the preferred method for several municipalities across Ontario in administrating retrofit programs. 
Under the proposed model, each participating property would be eligible to receive up to $20,000 in the form of a low interest fixed rate loan. Upon completion of the project, the balance of the loan is broken into equal payments across a predetermined term. This is usually 10 to 15 years. With eligible, or sorry, with repayments appearing as special charges on the regular property tax bills that citizens will receive. Eligible building types for the Better Homes Hamilton program include detached, semi-detached, townhomes, and row homes. Any Hamiltonian who owns an eligible property, who is current on their property tax account, and whose property does not have any outstanding liens may apply to the Better Homes Hamilton program. The BHH program finances a variety of expenses considered eligible under the LIC loan format. For ease, these expenses can be broken into four key categories. Home energy assessments and permits. All assessment expenses related to the retrofit process may be eligible under the loan format, including building permits, air tightness or blower door testing, and the cost of both pre and post EnerGuide assessments completed by certified energy advisors. While EnerGuide assessments are not mandated under the program design, it is highly advisable participants do complete them as pre and post assessments are required steps in order to access the federal rebates. Secondly, mechanical upgrades such as smart thermostats, smart controllers, as well as air source heat pumps in all configurations appearing on Natural Resource Canada's eligible inventory list are, are considered eligible. For context, air source heat pumps are efficient heating and cooling system which transfers heat between spaces rather than combusting them to generate fuel. Air source heat pumps come in a variety of configurations including mini split units which are perfectly suited to heat and cool homes without central ductwork, as well as cold climate rated units able to heat a home through the winter as well as hybrid units which complement existing furnaces. Building envelope upgrades such as air sealing and draft proofing as well as attic, basement and exterior wall insulation are all eligible. Lastly, we want to future proof homes and we are recommending supporting upgrades that are required to install an air source heat pump be considered eligible under the program design. Supporting upgrades would include a breaker panel upgrade up to 200 amps as well as ductwork repair if required. What's powerful about these supporting upgrades is the, the breaker panel could also serve to future ready homes for further electrification including electric vehicles or maybe even electric hot water heating. Last, participants will be supported via an energy coach. As previously mentioned, the energy coach will provide one-on-one -on -one services to each participant offering project management advice as well as guidance in how to access rebates. Since participants will be required to gather their own quotes, a contractor registry of contractors who have shown best practices, testimonials, and the requisite skill set and training to accomplish these retrofits will be made available for informational purposes only. Let's run through a quick example of how the average Better Homes Hamilton participant may interact with our program. As mentioned previously, through the research completed by LightSpark Inc, as well as the CCCM's own research, we've determined that 56% of, uh, of dwellings within Hamilton are defined as single detached homes. Of that 56%, over 66,800 dwellings in the city can be attributed to this archetype B as labeled by LightSpark, which is a 1950s home construction with a conventional high efficiency natural gas furnace. Even with a high efficiency furnace, these dwellings emit an average of 4.89 tons of carbon emissions annually. So let's walk through how, how this participant may interact with the Better Homes Hamilton program. In this scenario, the homeowner wants more efficient heating and cooling. They may be aware that there are rebates out there, but they are intimidated by the paperwork that is required to get the rebate process off the ground. They don't even know where to begin. Even if they come to terms with the application process, they quickly realize in order to access these rebates, they would be required to finance the cost of the retrofits themselves. Therefore, either relying on personal savings or having to go out to a financial institution and take a potentially high interest loan. This is the point where many homeowners stop their journey. There's too much headache, it's too confusing, and there are too many unknowns. Enter the Better Homes Hamilton program. With the BHH program, the homeowner not only has access to low interest fixed rate financing, but the guidance required to undertake the retrofit program in an intelligent manner, as well as 
to access um, as many rebates as possible through consultations with the energy coach. Simply put, the homeowner gets the benefit of having a newly renovated, more comfortable home, and the city gets the benefit of working towards greenhouse gas emissions goals. So it's a win-win. Within the table provided, we can see two columns. The first column titled expenses shows the average cost of retrofit selected. In this scenario, the homeowner undertakes a pre-energy, uh, pre-retrofit energy guide assessment in order to be eligible for the rebates mentioned before. Through consultation with the energy coach, they then decide to improve their attic insulation to R25 and install an air source heat pump to replace their furnace and air conditioning units. The total cost of renovations comes to $20,000. And on the second col column, we can see what the actual cost of the participant would be after all the rebates have been collected and considered. For our homeowners, participating in the BHH program allows them to complete retrofits, which would be previously challenging to finance. And in doing so, we will be able to see, they, they will be able to see, see a return on investment quicker by being able to access rebates, as well as the city will be able to recover funds quicker um, because these, these people will have more liquid cap. But the savings don't end there. As we know, the government of Canada has placed a price on pollution. Currently in 2023, the price on carbon is $65 per ton, but will scale to $170 per ton by 2030. So recall that our participants' home emitted 4.89 tons of uh, carbon per year. Assuming a very conservative 60% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions year over year, we can expect that our participant would stand to save $1,800 in deferred carbon tax payments alone between 2023 and 2030, as well as $327 per year um, moving forward after 2030. Having explained the dynamics of the Better Homes Hamilton program, the CCCM recommends the Office of Climate Change in Initiatives incubate the program in the form of a two-year pilot program before scaling. The CCCM re recommends retrofitting 50 properties from a variety of archetypes identified in LightSpark's archetype report from a diverse group of homeowners across various demographics and through different regions of the city. <laughs> It is recommended that during the pilot program phase, a 0% interest rate is offered on a 15-year term. Research shows a 0% interest rate using an LIC loan framework has been used to great effect in other pro pilot programs across Ontario to both gain public trust and incentivize early adoption in the program. All other parameters relating to particip participant eligibility and eligible expenses would remain the same as the core program, which I just described during the pilot phase. In order to ensure a smooth program launch, the following next steps are recommended. First, that the Office of Climate Change Initiatives hire a senior project manager with the requisite skill set to act as the energy coach and assist with pre-launch activities. Second, that the Office of Climate Change Initiatives brings forward the bylaws required to support the Better Homes Hamilton program for council approval. Under Ontario law, all LIC programs require bylaws which empower the municipality to loan funds to finance energy efficiency measures on private properties, as well as enable the mechanism to reclaim the loaned funds via a special charge on property tax bills. Third, the Office of Climate Change Initiatives, is, it's recommended that they work with key departments within the City of Hamilton to develop interdepartmental workflows to ensure smooth and timely handling of application and funds upon program launch. Having concluded my portion of the presentation, I'll hand things back over to Trevor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nico. Through you, Deputy Mayor, to members of the General Issues Committee, <clears throat> I hope uh, members of the General Issues Committee can see uh, this the amount of research and work um, that the CCCM um, and the City of Hamilton has done uh, in terms of stakeholder engagement, research, building archetype analysis, et cetera, to inform these following key recommendations. The first recommendation is the approval of the incubation stage, and a very brief three-pager overview is included as Appendix A, which highlights the, the key program elements, eligibility that Nico just went over. The second direction, as, as Nico mentioned, is required, is direction that staff bring forward the enabling local improvement charge bylaw at a future meeting prior to program launch. The third is to launch the incubation stage with a target of 50 homes before the end of 2024. We heard from previous delegates um, that we agree a 50 home target over two years or before 2024 is both ambitious and doable with the current staff resources that we're expecting to support this program. 
In order to support the launch of the program, we are asking approval uh, for a $1 million loan receivable be put on the city's balance sheet. In addition to that incubation stage program and a, the second budget consideration is staff are seeking approval of 275,000 uh, uh, from be, that be taken from the climate change reserve for fixed costs to run the program, such as things including a loan loss reserve as a risk mitigation strategy, the marketing required and education and promotion of the program, software for tracking of important metrics and reporting requirements, as well as additional staff support. And the, the final key recommendation is that staff report back within two years on the results and feasibility for scaling. If council approves these recommendations, city staff will immediately begin working on the next steps in order to launch the pilot program. This will include, of course, the enabling bylaw, but will also include a homeowner education campaign and contractor registry campaign in partnership with the Center for Climate Change Management as per our initial project partnership agreement that utilizes the remaining FCM funding that we've already gotten. The city's uh, engage page will be updated to reflect the updated branding of the program should council uh, approve it. And additional information related to program launch will be found on the website as well. I thank you so much uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, to General Chiefs Committee for your time. And both Nico, Kate and I, and, and Dr. Lukasik are here to answer any questions. Thank you, and we have a extensive list here. Uh, first one is uh, uh, Councilor Alex Wilson, please. Uh, thank you. I won't be as extensive as we were on the survey, but I do just have a couple of questions between getting from here to there. And so in our climate action strategy by 2050, we've set the target of having retrofitted 100% of our city-owned buildings, 100% of the commercial buildings within the city, and 100% of the residential buildings to 50% of 2016 efficiency. So basically a 50% reduction in all public, residential, and commercial buildings by 2050. Um, I also know that the Climate Act, uh, the Office of Climate Change Initiatives is working on benchmarking those 2050 targets. Within the two year report back period, will we have those benchmarked targets done? Um, I know that's an early year priority for the Office of Climate Change. I don't know if that's a question for Director Lukasik or for Trevor. Through, yes. through you, Deputy Mayor, to Council Area Wilson. I'll start and perhaps uh, hand it to uh, Director Lukasik for any further comments. Um, and you're exactly right, is the, one of the main purposes of this incubation, incubation stage um, is not only to get our feet wet in this new space and to learn and to tweak the, the processes, the internal processes, uh, but as well as to look at the feasibility of scaling to that long range target, which as you rightfully mentioned is substantial in that the Community Energy and Emissions Plan does point to essentially 100% uh, of our buildings need to be retrofitted to a 50% energy efficiency. So this program, this two-year period, uh, will also be looking at uh, feasibility of scaling, both in terms of uh, multi-sector scalability, so looking at multi-unit resident residential buildings, looking at scaling into commercial and industrial buildings, as well as looking at scalability of the financial mechanisms as well, knowing that the city uh, within its own budget would not be able to uh, fund such a large program, so looking at other sources of funding, including including uh, potentially a $10 million loan grant uh, from the federal government, but as well as looking at leveraging private equity as well and looking with third-party financial institutions. Um, to your specific question about when we come back in two years, will we be benchmarking? Happy to take that as, as kind of a, a direction. Um, and I know through working with uh, uh, Director Lukasik that year-by-year -year benchmarking and those year-by-year -year targets is something we're striving for. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much for that answer. And th through you, Chair, really appreciate the clarity that we may not be able to do this ourselves, I think acknowledging that. And so I would hope that when we talk about scaling up, we don't get the report back that says, here are three ways that we could do better than we did yesterday. And instead, the report back on scaling up says, here's what it would take to do what is necessary. And then if we fall short, as was just done in BC and other municipalities in BC do this all the time, they talk about the funding gap in their climate plan. Constantly, there's a funding gap identified. Um, I would really hope that that report back identifies the funding gap and we don't just lower our targets based on what we think is achievable within our wheelhouse and then start having a climate plan that's no longer based on those science-based targets. Um, I do have another question okay. is if we know about the yep. uptake of private retrofits. So how far are we on this journey already in the city? Um, this targeted, this program's targeted specific individual, you know, specific individuals, homeowners in the city, um, thinking about those biggest impacts. Who are some of the folks in the city who've already taken these steps on their own accord? 
Through you, Deputy Chair, I may pass that to uh, our lead researcher who's done a lot of work on, on the past retrofits, uh, Nico Strabek, to see if he has any comments on the, the numbers. Through you, Deputy Mayor, to the, to the Councillor. Um, I'll be quite honest with you that part of the research question was a little bit out of scope of our, of our current work plan. Um, I think that to get an answer like that, you'd, you'd really have to have quite a significant public engagement campaign or survey. I do know that anecdotally, um, there is a drive towards uh, air source heat pumps. There's a lot of buzz on um, the Bay Area Climate Change Council social media about that, as well as others. Um, speaking with major industry players, including HRAI, so the Heating Refrigerating um, Association, or oh, sorry, Air Conditioning Institute, I'm sorry, HRAI, um, <laughs> there, there, is, there is a push. There is a push um, towards uh, air source heat pumps. People realize that they are efficient, that they are safe, and that they're, that they're um, increasing home comfort. So it's a very roundabout answer, and I apologize for rambling, but it, it, it's not something that we're able to quantify at this time. Th thank you, and through the chair, I'd expect that we're probably all safe in this room, assuming that it's under 5% of the building, so clearly we got a lot of room to go. It's been some early adopters, and that's great. Um, again, on that note, I'm just thinking uh, when we talk about getting to 100% of buildings, we're talking about the this former HERO program, now the... Um, oh, the Hamilton, ooh, sorry, I have HERO in my head, the former HERO program, um, moving this forward, it's focusing on homeowners, but we also know renters are a part of this conversation. We've been talking a lot about acquisition from the housing side of things. Is there some synergies or have there been some conversations with folks in housing? We just heard about land trust today as a community-led model. Are these conversations coming together? Are we seeing the synergies between retrofits and acquisition? Through you, Deputy Chair, to Councillor Wilson. I think that's a really good question, and unfortunately, we don't have the answer in terms of that specific synergy with land trust. I know the issues and the unintended consequences with tenants related to these retrofits have been extensively uh, researched, and lots of conversations uh, with those organizations that represent those tenant groups have been discussed. Looking at different synergies uh, through like a land trust or co ops um, wasn't currently part of this conversation, uh, but I think all hands on deck, as, as, as you mentioned, uh, in terms of getting to that 100% retrofits and, and through that two-year feasibility study, we'd be looking at all of those potential options as well. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Your time yeah. is up, and uh, I just want to let all council know that it's 2.30 almost, and we have a long list of speakers, uh, and we have uh, an extent, we've got lots to go, so keep that in mind. I love the questions, we, we want to have the question, we want the answer, but uh, keep them shorter. I'm giving you latitude, but I'm not anymore. Five minutes, that's it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Nan. I won't take it personally that the hammer for five minutes is <laughs> five coming minutes right I'm before coming. I'm speaking. Through you, <laughs> Through you Deputy Mayor. Uh, thanks to staff and our uh, partners from Mohawk for the presentation and really truly appreciating the thoroughness of the research components that are going in to help hopefully like Councillor A. Wilson mentioned, get us towards our, our benchmarking and our ability to really uh, tell the story accurately and get us to where we need to get given the, the emergency in front of all of us. A couple of quick questions, um, having said that. The, um, uh, in terms of the piece around rental units, now I know that the program, every iteration we've talked about it previously around this horseshoe, we've been talking about equity and taking uh, income into account and making sure that those households that may not otherwise be able to access federal programs or other uh, programs be able to access this one. So can you share a little bit more detail there? Because I know it's in the written report, but it wasn't mentioned in the presentation. Thank, thank you. Through you, Deputy Mayor, to Council and Ann. Uh, always, as always, a great point and a great question. So the in terms of the um, the equity pieces uh, in, in terms of both a, a low-income barrier, I think in its program and in its essence, utilizing the LIC framework that puts the loan on the property instead of the person um, is a low barrier option to potentially low income uh, households that own their homes that would not otherwise qualify for traditional financing. So because the loan is put on the property, uh, there is, uh, uh, as, as Nico mentioned, uh, the eligibility really is that that property owner needs to be up to date and have the eligible 
suitable archetype for building. So their credit score or their ability, their, their income uh, would not be considered in terms of their eligibility. So that is a reduced barrier as well. Um, and then of course, um, uh, well, I shouldn't say of course. Uh, Nico also saw, um, just brought up this map, if I can, I'm not sure if I can go back to it. Um, he mentioned the uh, Canadian uh, Urban Sustainability Practitioners energy poverty mapping as well, yeah. which shows that those energy burdens and energy poverty uh, for households um, are fairly city widespread, but there are certain areas uh, in Hamilton uh, where there are more uh, uh, rates of those energy poverty. So, really using that evidence informed decision making to then target those neighborhoods uh, to ensure that we're having those targeted education interventions to show that those homes homeowners have the ability to access uh, this type of financing as well. Thank you. Through you, Deputy Mayor. So in terms of that targeted outreach, is that part of what the 250 or there are so uh, administrative funds towards supporting the program, is that par part and parcel of the work that that's going to be engaged with staff there? Through you, Deputy Mayor, to Councilor Lanier, that is correct. The, the, a big piece of the program um, needs to be a, a healthy marketing budget, and within that marketing budget will be the targeted interventions within those neighborhoods. Excellent. And could you speak a little bit through you, Deputy Mayor, in terms of uh, some of the parts around the program uh, eligibility as it speaks to uh, unavo uh, sorry, avoiding um, rent evictions or increased rent payments? Uh, as a result of uh, landlords potentially engaging in this program. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, Council Um I'll, I'll start off and I'll hand it over to, to Nico about all of the great uh, research he's done to avoid those unintended consequences. Uh, but first and foremost, we've made it clear in Appendix A in the program terms that any retrofits that would uh, displace the existing tenants would not be eligible uh, for this financing program. And second point as well is that uh, in the application process, there will be a check mark that says, is this your primary residence or is this a, a rental. Uh, when that application is checked rental, that then triggers a process internally um, that the, the energy coaching person that will be hired for this position would then send out a mail out to that tenant with the rights uh, of that tenant um, and help with any, um, any questions that that tenant may have. And uh, I'll just uh, hand it over to Nico just to help supplement that question. Yes, thank you, Trevor. Um, I'll, I would just add that I've had the, the good fortune of speaking with many thoughtful program coordinators across the province and the country. Uh, within the Ontario legislative um, landscape, uh, without getting too jargony, I will just say many programs in Ontario have embedded explicit language, which I have included in my recommendation report, which prohibits if, if the applicant is a landlord, which prohibits the landlord from applying for above guideline rent increases uh, to offset the cost of the special charge onto the, the tenant, so I'll just point that out. I would also just like to um, skip back for just a couple of seconds to your earlier question about affordability and income quality, or in income qualifying programs. Um, we do know that Enbridge Gas has a home winterproofing program, which is income qualifying, and it is, uh, very underutilized at this time. In fact, you know, I'm constantly seeing on targeted ads, social media feeds, lots of ads for this program. That energy concierge would help participants to make a good financial decision for them. So if, if the payments are mapped out, if, if the, Essentially, the entire retrofit process should be laid out for the participant, including the cost of payments moving forward. If that is deemed unaffordable, the energy concierge would, or coach would then point them towards income qualifying programs so that this person can achieve free retrofits. And then they could come back to us maybe at a later stage with, frankly, a home that is in a really good spot to even go deeper in that climate mitigation um, journey. So I realize I'm over time. I just wanted to provide some context. Thank you. No, no, Council, no, you have no worries. Minute. I really appreciate it through the deputy mayor because I think that what we're um, exemplifying in this line of questioning and the responses from our presenters is the integrated lens that we have been talking a lot about around this table this term, about being able to integrate an equity and climate lens, and this program is achieving that exactly. And uh, so I'm really looking forward to approving the recommendations that are before us and helping us get down that road. Thank you. Okay, next is Co Councillor Mick Meekin. And uh, a question, please. I get it. Um, <coughs> uh, Mohawk College is my alma mater. I'm very proud of that. Uh, very proud of the college um, up in your area, I think. 
And um, I just want to say uh, uh, for the record how, how really uh, pleased I am to see the fulsome proposal that you've made. Uh, you've obviously um, come well prepared, well thought out. Um, and I'm not surprised given the college uh, was the first to build a major net zero uh, addition. Um, uh, Ron McCurley, the president up there uh, and his team and, and the, uh, the building science faculty and the climate change management center and the conservation and demand programs and energy hubs that you run up there so successfully are just a blessing to our city, Madam Deputy Mayor. And I, I'm so pleased that Mohawk is here doing this as a, as a partner and uh, mentioning the partners and pleased that Dr. Lukasik has, uh, uh, this is the kind of work I think the Climate Change Office is, is going to do, be bringing the, 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 uh, the uh, rock stars in to, uh, to help us to grab a uh, good handle on this. So. Uh, so well done. I uh, want to just footnote uh, one, one other real blessing and something we can all be very thankful for. Mohawk College has always been inclined to be very practical in terms of, uh, of inculcating the skill sets that, uh, that we need. And I know there's no college, I know this personally from my experiences with as former parliamentary sec secretary to all the uh, all the colleges and universities in the province. There's no college in Ontario that's doing a better job of training uh, for the green economy and for retrofitting and all the kinds of mechan mechanical things there at the Mohawk College. So congratulations in full support. Whatever you need, I think we should, uh, should agree to. Um, we'll pilot it, uh, the plane will take off and uh, you'll, have trouble, you'll have trouble landing it. That's okay. how good it is, thanks. That's great, great questions. Okay, <laughs> Councillor Cesar. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Pauls. Uh, and through you to the presenters, thank you very much. Excellent presentation, uh, very important topic, uh, fully supportive. I just wanted to go back with one question. On page, or slide eight, you would outline the potential costs and then the savings that could be achieved and the bottom line was about $13,000 in the example you gave. And then on slide nine, you were talking about the potential savings, because I think it's very important from a homeowner's point of view, big investment, huge environmental benefit, but also there's a financial benefit to them. And I just wanted to clarify, because there was a little bit of uh, disturbance in chambers when you were going over this point here. Uh, the one bullet point says carbon pollution pricing savings for 2023 to 30, uh, $1,805. So I'd just like you to, to dig into the the savings from energy and what you have on here is carbon pollution pricing savings and just speak to the financial benefit to the homeowner overall. Thank you. Thank you for the question and through you Deputy Mayor to the Councillor. Um, yes, ec excellent point and I'm happy to uh, clarify further. So on slide nine that $1,805 is um, just some really rough back of the envelope math to, to show what the average, a, a very conservative might add, a very conservative estimate of the average carbon tax savings uh, from now until 2030. So being with, with a science background, I don't like to overpromise. Um, I chose 60% as the very conservative estimate because that is frankly 10% below what some other programs advertise as the average, um, as the average GHG savings. So um, two part answer. So the first part of the answer is just around the, the, carbon, the carbon tax savings. Um, we know that I'll also say the the home that I that I chose to sh to spotlight in the presentation was the most abundant archetype in the city. So I deemed that as the average participant. We have some participants that or some houses within our city that are on oil burning furnaces that emit over 15 tons of carbon per year. So those households would be extremely incentivized from just a tax deferral standpoint to upgrade their heating system to a lower carbon uh, standard. Um, in terms of energy efficiency and, and what, you know, beyond just tax deferrals, what's it look like on utility bills? 
I'll be quite honest with council, it is hard to determine um, those figures sometimes because so much is dependent on the actual structural integrity of the building that is being retrofitted. Does your home have exterior wall insulation? Was your home built before 1960? Is your home a newer home? So that is why that energy coach position is so important to be hired with a building science skill set, maybe even someone who has experience completing home energy audits, so that they can say, um, quite frankly, you know what, you as a homeowner, your, your furnace is only six years old. Maybe you don't need to replace it for an air source heat pump, but you could save X amount of dollars by doing substantial insulation. Your home is frankly under insulated. That way that our participants will see immediate uh, savings on their utility bills, maybe not need to go all the way to that $20,000 maximum, but immediately start seeing some benefits. Now, there will be other homeowners who will require that $20,000 maximum. Maybe, they, maybe their air conditioning unit and their furnace is, is dying, and an air source heat pump makes sense for them financially, because we know that air source heat pumps have what's called a coefficient of performance, which is a three to one ratio of heat output for energy consumed. So you can assume there that you're being about you know, 30% more, more efficient. Now that's just from the literature, and as I mentioned, there are many, many variables, including the type of home, the state of the home, um, that will determine actual on-bill uh, impacts. Right, thank you for that. And just a clarifying question then, I think what I heard you say is, not in the presentation are the dollars that could be saved from energy costs that are be on their bill. So and I think that's an, if that, that's the case, correct? Yes. So correct. and and I know it's difficult to to project. I think it would be valuable when marketing deputy mayor to the public uh, to help understand that because the initial look at this would say, oh, I can save eighteen hundred dollars over the next seven or eight years and I'm investing 13000 and there's this whole other bucket that I'm going to be saving, but it, that's not clear here. So I think it's just uh, some advice on a marketing point of view, make some assumptions, maybe a range, just to il illustrate the bigger picture on savings. Absolutely. But thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, Councillor Jackson. Thanks so much, Deputy Mayor Pauls, and uh, excellent uh, presentation with uh, pioneering program here, Special Projects Manager Imhoff and nice to meet uh, project lead Strabic and college GM uh, Kate Flynn as well. Three quick questions, Deputy Mayor Pauls, and they are questions, Good. Deputy Mayor Pauls. Uh, through you to uh, Trevor. Trevor, first of all, um, who will be eligible for this program? I'm gonna presume this isn't for millionaires to apply for, mm -hmm. correct? Can you give me some idea? Is there any um, household income eligibility on this? Through you, Deputy Mayor Pauls. Through you, <clears throat> through you, Deputy Mayor to Councillor Jackson, really great question. And I think this program, as I mentioned through Councillor Nan's point of questioning, is utilizing the uh, LIC framework, um, is lowering the barrier for any person, property, uh, who is eligible uh, to participate, which is really based on their type of building. So single detached, semi-detached, uh, townhome, um, uh, and, and row home. And so, their credit or how much they make or how little they make is not factored in um, in terms of the eligibility. There will, however, be targeted intervention and priority through the application process and again through that energy coaching service to, uh, to help to target those areas across Hamilton that we know have a high energy burden uh, as well as where the building stock is the oldest so we have the most uh, impact as well. So we're helping those who need it most and the buildings are being updated who are, who, the buildings are the oldest that need to, to have the most. We don't wanna exclude those I'll say rich people to participate, um, but I'm expecting um, that given their wealth and their, uh, their their level of income, they would not find this program as attractive. They would just use their own savings or they would go through that traditional financial uh, institution loan, for example, rather than go through this program. You've raised my comfort level with the uh, second part of your answer. I, I really wouldn't understand why any millionaire plus person would even uh, be eligible for this program. I like the targeting of what you did in the latter part of your answer, um, Special Project Manager Imhoff, but I really, uh, it, would, it would baffle me and, and cause me uh, to be dismayed that a millionaire across our city uh, would take advantage of this $20,000 loan that uh, he or she could easily afford on their own to retrofit their own home. Second question. Deputy Mayor Pauls, 
Um, have you anticipated any forfeiture once somebody has been approved for the program and uh, for whatever reason, after approval, uh, retrofitting is underway, something has happened within the household, financially, mortgage-wise, whatever it might be, having to leave town, have you anticipated any forfeiture and how would the municipality and taxpayers handle that? Through you, Deputy Mayor, please. Through you, Deputy Mayor, to Councillor Jackson, another very important question and something we did we have been considering throughout the program design. The uh, through the research, and I'll, I'll see, I'll kind of point to Nico to make sure I'm getting this this number right. But through the research of existing municipalities who undertake this type of legislation and this loan process, the default rates are extremely low, in between the one to five percent mark uh, for cities like Toronto who've been operating this type of program for ten plus years. So default rates are very low because of um, it being placed on the property and being paid back regularly through the property taxes. Should the worst case scenario happen um, and people, uh, property owners start going into default on what, what now would be considered their taxes, right? Because this loan is getting put on their property and paid back through the taxes. The city would follow its already established regular process to begin collection of those uh, tax arrears. Excellent, that, that's uh, very encouraging as well, just on the protection of the every, the everyday constituent I represent. Um, and lastly, uh, uh, through you, Deputy Mayor Paul's third question, who then, uh, I've applied, uh, hypothetically, someone's applied, uh, they've gotten their permit, they've gotten their approval for the 20 grand, uh, over the period, I think you said 10 years payback, who oversees it? Do we send somebody from municipal law uh, every six months? Hey, how the, how's uh, the retrofit going there, homeowner A? Uh, do we wait for them to report back? Give me some idea of the follow-up and the oversight. Through you, Deputy Mayor Pauls. Through you, Deputy Mayor, to Councillor Jackson. Uh, there's multiple checks and balances being designed into this program. I'll say the first check and balance is that the loan uh, will allow that pre and post energy assessment, which also then qualifies them for free or rebate money from the federal government as well. Okay. So uh, a homeowner comes in, they say, hey, Trevor, or it won't be me, it'll be the new senior project manager who will be running this program. Um, to answer your question in, in a short answer, it will be the Office of Climate Change Initiatives um, administering and running the day-to-day -day of this program, obviously in, in very close support with our finance and legal and taxation colleagues. Um, and in the property owner agreements, there will be another checks and balances if, and this is a big if, if there's a building permit pulled, we're not expecting a, a permit required for several of these types of uh, retrofits, um, but if a permit is pulled, the building inspector would obviously go and do their due diligence and do the building inspection. But then the, the, the third piece of the checks and balances will be in the property owner agreement. Uh, we'll have the ability that someone from the city, a city staff official, whether it be someone from the Office of Climate Change Initiatives or building division, most likely building division, um, still to be determined, would be able to go out within that three-year time to inspect to make sure the work is done and that that has the impact. Um, also, we want the ability to, if required or is asked, if we ask them, they give us their utility data so we can track their utility to Councillor Kassar's very uh, astute point. Um, we want to make sure that it's it's saving energy and saving uh, on the utility bills. So this is part about the, uh, the incubation two-year pilot program to really understand those utility cost savings as well. Sounds like uh, Special Projects Manager, you have anticipated already some of these queries and um, upside and potential downsides. I'm incredibly impressed uh, with your answers and responses. And to uh, Director Dr. Lukasik, I think you uh, were made for the bureaucracy, uh, Director Lukasik. Back-to-back excellent reports, and I'm fully supportive to give this two-year pilot a try. And thanks for the smiles around the chamber. Thank you, <laughs> thank you Deputy thank Mayor Pauls. Okay, Mayor Horvath. <laughs> thank you, uh, Chair Pauls. Um, I just have one, one small question. In fact, it's a it's a good segue from the last uh, um, discussion around the utilities. And my only question is, to what extent is there interface with utilities who also have programs? And you touched on it in terms of Enbridge, uh, but there are other utilities, other entities that uh, provide uh, incentive programs. And so is there integration there in any way? Or, or is, it, is there competition there? Um, how does it all kind of fit together? Thank you. 
Through you, Deputy Mayor, to Mayor Horvath. Uh, really great question. And I think as you know, and everyone is aware, the retrofit and grant landscape, both at the federal, provincial, local utility level is in a state of constant change. So that in mind, um, this program is designed to be as eligible, or sorry, as flexible and stackable with those other programs, whether it be the federal uh, Greener Homes Grant, which is now administered by Enbridge. Uh, we've had lots of conversations with Electra, our local uh, electrical provider as well, um, and, and they are aware of this program um, that we're, we're proposing. Um, and so really, uh, it comes down to that fundamental, and I think it's, it is actually serendipitous uh, that Mr. Braden was here to talk about the energy coaching and the concierge service, because that's exactly what we're proposing here, is that hand-holding, that frontline counter staff support that says, okay, the goal of this program is not to loan them as much money as possible from the city, it's to help the homeowners navigate the complexity of building retrofits, and whether that's through our program, through an electrical provider, a federal program, uh, Ontario government, um, that energy coach concierge service is instrumental in this program, and that's where uh, we feel the, the greatest value will be. Uh, thank you very, very much. That's exactly what I was looking for in terms of a response, and I just want to say that I agree with a lot of the comments around, well, all of the comments around the table, although I'm not sure that, uh, uh, that uh, <laughs> uh, Dr. Lukasik was thrilled about saying she belongs in the bureaucracy. <laughs> I think that's more what we were chuckling about than anything else. But nonetheless, I really do have a lot of respect for the work that you're doing. It was a very thorough um, presentation, very thorough responses, and a really engaged count committee. So thank, thank you so you much. Thank you. Um, can I give the chair to Councillor Jackson? I just, um, I, I know you were here. I was surprised at the survey we just did, the city surveys, that said 1% uh, were concerned about climate change and uh, so on, but their main concern was about standard of living, and uh, which is declined, obviously, because I believe COVID-19, everybody is standard, it has declined. But my question is, uh, you said for this pilot, you would do a roughly 50 homes. You hope to get 50 homes. We have 177,000 homes, just homes. Um, is 50 achievable, or is it a lot? I, I don't know, 50, th uh, 50 homes in two years. Doesn't seem a lot to me if people are really concerned about this issue. Special Projects Manager. Thank you, uh, through the chair to, to uh, Deputy Mayor Pauls. Um, yeah, that's a really great question, and I think the research supports that target of 50 homes within those two years, um, mainly because this is a brand new program for the city of Hamilton. Uh, a big part of this, it will be to set up the financial uh, processes in the back end um, that will be able to give out the loans and then recover them through regular tax payments. So there's a lot of internal uh, administrative work that needs to happen um, and to be set up. So. We do feel, and I think it's, uh, it was supported through some of our external delegates, that that 50 home range is ambitious but achievable. And I'll just reference, for example, Town of Halton Hills, smaller municipality than us, uh, they, tr they, they had a target in their pilot program of 20, and they only got 10, nine or 10 participants. Um, other pilot municipalities um, are, are starting with this smaller incubation stage to then really, as uh, discussed through the line of questioning through Councillor A. Wilson, is through this pilot program, really figuring out how to exponentially scale these retrofits, because as you rightfully point out, uh, Councillor uh, Pauls, Deputy Mayor Pauls, is that there are a lot of buildings in Hamilton and we need to retrofit almost 100% of them. We won't be able to do it ourselves in that scaled version, but this is the first step to look at that benchmarking year by year of what do we need to do to get to that long range target. Right, and I think, uh, you know, as we get out of COVID completely and move on, more people will look at that. So, so thank you for that. We're going to now. Back to you then, Deputy Mayor. Oh, yes, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, um, may I have a, a mover and a seconder, please? Uh, Councillor Cesar and Councillor Nan, thank you. And we're going to vote on that. That's to receive the presentation. Oh, received, uh, so, received, sorry. What's, what's happening? I think we're having. <laughs> okay, we're going to move on. 
what page I'm at in. Get on the report. First we vote that. Okay. Thank you. Okay, now on the report, may I have a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Crutch and Councillor Jackson. Okay. Whatever. <laughs> Thank you. Is there any discussion on, okay, Councillor Crutch, your name's not there, but it's, I see it. Thanks. Um, just briefly, very, very briefly, I want to say that I think in these kinds of situations, it's about having a bit of vision. So that's our job as governors and as a council is to have the vision to be able to say, okay, and everybody may not be clamoring for this thing, but we can see the potential for it to have an important impact. Um, we're not always gonna be able to measure the right now in this moment. Um, this many residents think this is an amazing thing to do, but we can look outside our city, we can look at best practices, we can look at the impacts this has had other places. Um, and I think this is a great thing to do in that way. It's getting us in the right direction. Glad it's happening, which it could happen faster. Wish, I just wish we could accelerate this even faster, but I'm glad we're at the incubation stage at least. Very supportive of it. Those are my comments. Thank Thanks. you. All right, we're going to move on. Uh, 8-3. Oh. oh, okay. Councilor A. Yeah, Wilson. Just a question to either Director Lukasik or General Manager Thorne about recommendation G. This is the report back recommendation in the report. Just wondering if the conversation about uh, reporting back um, explicitly in line with our climate action strategy, including those benchmarking pieces, including a funding gap, is that level of direction that's explicitly welcome in the direction to report back? Just want to ensure that we're in the best spot in two years from now and happy to include that as direction if needed today. Um, so through the chair, sorry, I'm, I'm not sure. The I'm question? Just, so the conversation the asked earlier during the presentation was, will the report back include benchmarking in relation to our targets to do retrofits by 2050? So we're not getting a report back in two years about here are the ways we can grow the program, but growing the program in the context of the targets we've set and ensuring it's in line with our climate strategy and identifying the funding gap outside of what the municipality can do if needed. Um, just wondering if that explicitly needs to be asked to be in their recommendations. So, so through the chair, uh, thanks for the clarification. So, so I don't think it necessarily needs to be explicit. I think the, the potential to scale up the project is inherent within the fact that this is, we're looking at this as a as sort of the initial uh, phase, the initial pilot. So I think what it would take to scale up the project is going to be part of that uh, report back. So I have no concerns if you want to make it explicit, but that certainly is the intent. Okay. Thanks, that's all from me. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, okay, on the report. Now we need a mover and a seconder to approve the recommendation. And we have in Council. We have Kretsch it. Oh, sorry. Okay. Jackson. So let's vote. Okay, we're going to move on to eight three. Uh, Okay, and it carries 13 to zero. Eight three, Hamilton Region Decarbonization Hub, citywide. Cyrus Tarani, Chief De uh, Digital Officer and Director of Innovation, and Linda Lusak, Director, Office of Climate Change Initiatives, are with us to provide the presentation. Thank you, welcome. Mayor, members of council, uh, my name is Cyrus Tranny. I'm the Chief Digital Officer and Director of Innovation. It is my pleasure to provide an update to council on the Hamilton Region Decarbonization Hub. This is a joint report between the City Manager's Office of Digital and Innovation, the Office of Climate Initiatives, and Economic Development. With me today co-presenting is Dr. Linda Lukasik, Director of the Office of Climate Initiatives, Norm Slehan, Director of Economic Development, as well as Dan Wicklum, who is the President and CEO of Transition Accelerator, are also present for any questions following the uh, presentation. In August of 2022, an initial report was uh, 
was a recommendation was brought forward to Council to pursue the funding of a Hamilton Region decarbonization hub and was approved by Council. At that time, Council conditionally approved a maximum funding of $240,000 or the equivalent of $60,000 a year from existing available budgets. Since that initial report, additional outreach and engagement has occurred with the purpose of today's report to provide Council with an update confirming full funding sources have been identified and a formal launch of the hub. The City's funding contribution represents, I will apologize, there is an error on this slide, 7.7% of the overall hub budget, which is outlined in Appendix A in detail of this report. Um, and based on the overall budget of 3.13 million, represents a 13 times multiplier for the City's investment of $240,000. Operations and logistics and coordination for the hub itself will be supported by the Transition Accelerator, which is a pan-Canadian not-for-profit that specializes in supporting Canada's transition to net zero. I'd now like to pass it over to Dr. Lukasik. Thanks, Director Tarani, through you, Deputy Mayor. Oh, thank you. So I want to provide some climate context. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today to share with in, in giving this information update regarding the Hamilton Region Decarbonization Hub. And I really want to underscore the critical role that the emerging hub will play and must play within the larger context of Hamilton's climate action strategy. The Community Energy and Emissions Plan, or SEEP as many of you know it, um, is our climate mitigation piece of Hamilton's climate action strategy and it recognizes that we need to innovate our industry in order to reach net zero by 2050, if not much sooner. And innovating our industry is one of the five major themes within that plan. And that should be no surprise given what you see on the screen up there. Um, industry is the largest contributor of greenhouse gas emissions in our community. So supporting and encouraging industrial efforts to decarbonize is key to achieving the city's targets. So according to our climate mitigation plan, innovating our industry requires that we facilitate, quote, actions focused on supporting the city's industry in decarbonizing and increasing the energy efficiency of their industrial processes. More specifically, the mitigation plan calls for the establishment of a net zero industrial working group, a space where industry can come together, seek technical and other expert support, figure out pathways to net zero, tap into collective synergies, secure necessary resources for action that could include both private sector and government investment, um, and track and share their progress with the broader community over time. That final one is a really important one to me, sitting where I'm sitting. So these are essential efforts, and it's work that's already emerging in the community. I think that's important to recognize. A Hamilton Region Decarbonization Hub is really going to help us to consolidate those efforts and support made in Hamilton solutions moving forward. And I want to add here that in Hamilton, we know how to do stakeholder consultations really well. Um, and so I've been using the um, Hamilton Harbor Remedial Action Planning process uh, for, the, for the watershed to see it delisted, delisted as a really good example just to help you to understand what I'm talking about. Um, so just like the stakeholder tables that have worked collectively on the harbor watershed over decades now um, through the Hamilton Harbor Remedial Action Plan with the goal to improve watershed health and to ultimately delist Hamilton Harbor as a Great Lakes area of concern, so too, I would argue, the Hamilton Region Decarbonization Hub can be structured to serve as a powerful stakeholder roundtable designed to facilitate decarbonization and establish targets and timelines for that ultimate goal of net zero carbon by 2050 or sooner. Our mitigation plan also calls for that net zero industrial working group to develop and deploy a zero emissions industry program supported by people with industry industrial energy management expertise. And Director Tarani is going to walk you through more detail regarding the structure and governance model for the hub. But I think you will agree that the proposed hub serves as the mitigation plans envision net zero industrial working group that will develop and deploy that zero emissions industry program and potentially more. I'm just going to share a little bit briefly here about how the hub aligns with other city initiatives. Um, so obviously, um, the hub aligns with the City of Hamilton's mission to reach net zero carbon emissions by 2050, and that was really born out of the City's approved motion to declare climate emergency back in 2019. 
Um, and it also helps, as I've explained, to implement actions set out in the Community Energy and Emissions Plan. And I'm anticipating that engaging industry on the mitigation side is really going to open the door to conversations about adaptation as well. Uh, and, I, and I would add that the network building that is facilitated by the hub should create opportunities to seek private sector support for an engagement in our 2023 priority focus areas within the Office of Climate Change Initiatives. Um, the, the hub proposal also aligns with several key economic development related initiatives within the municipality. And you can see some of those listed there, everything from our 2021 to 25 economic development action plan to the Bayfront industrial area strategy. And I just want to acknowledge again that Director Norm Schlee and, and Manager Jennifer Patterson are sitting in the audience today. And both of them I know are available to speak to how these strategies benefit from the hub um, and will help to facilitate take green jobs and the emergence of clean technology. And then of course, um, there's recognition that it helps with aligning to smart city and intelligent community focus areas. And I'm going to hand it back over now to Director Tranny to share the rest of the presentation with you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kazik. Uh, appreciating the concept of a decarbonized solution for uh, Hamilton is a new approach. Uh, Appendix E in this report provides a high-level overview of the hub model, sample structure, and governance. In the United States, for example, the recent Infrastructure and Job Acts has provided $8 billion to support the hub model. And though new for Hamilton, globally the hub model has been well established. The, the decarbonization hub will be a coordinated, purpose-driven enabler facilitator and force multiplier that aligns partners and creates coalitions to advance change, in this case, towards a net zero future. The hub will help to link low cost energy supply with very low or zero carbon footprint energy sources with new reliable markets for the associated energy sources in advanced manufacturing, transportation and building sectors. It is important to also note that it is a made in Hamilton approach that will have de dedicated staff to solely support the Hamilton decarbonization hub, including promotion of staff positions locally, advocating for Hamilton solutions to meet net zero targets and driven by local priorities. The hub itself, as illustrated here uh, with some additional information, is not a legal structure, but a high communication, high trust, high collaboration model. Um, which, and the slide, the diagram on the side here gives us an idea of the draft governance structure for, that is typical for hubs, which would include a steering committee and integrating, integrating secretariat that would manage day-to-day -day operations as well as support the specific sector-specific action teams. The larger hub ecosystem would not, not also, also not only help support increased economic activity, but allow for additional expansion or opportunities by a philanthropy as well as the hub acting as a catalyst for new, new career pathways to support the net zero economy. This slide outlines initially identified action teams that will be facilitated as part uh, of the hub and ensuring open communication and information sharing across all action teams. The city will also play a key role in participating as members of the applicable action teams who will also help identify, facilitate and support net zero priorities and projects. Significant engagement has happened to gauge interest uh, previously as part of the initial efforts of the report that was brought forward previously and those efforts have continued since. There is significant interest in moving from theory to actual implementation and, launches and the launch has continued to receive uh, support from a broad range of stakeholders as outlined in this slide some of those interested stakeholders have also lent their voice in support of the hub via delegations, either verbally or in written form, received today by council. The hub's targeted focused outcomes will be coordinating and building low or zero carbon energy demand to support sector development, demonstrating leadership, environmental, social, economic, to attract investment in a broad range of economic development, improving relations and knowledge across industries, public organizations, and the community at large, and facilitating the industrial sector's ability to reach net zero carbon emissions by or before 2050. This slide outlines some of the key steps required to formalize the hub and some estimated timelines to achieve those, including finalizing the funding agreements now that the full con contributor uh, contributions have been identified, begin the recruitment process for hub leadership, establishing the steering committee membership, 
terms of reference, developing the broader hub governance model, hiring hub staff, and launching the action teams. Thank you, and happy to take questions at this time. Thank you, Cyrus. And we do have a speaker's list. Uh, Councillor <coughs> Crutch. It's a very quick question. That's for Dr. Lukasik. Uh, I know she's been involved in lots of other hub type work in the past. Um, and I know there's some targeted outcomes here in the presentation. What I'm wondering is if you, you know, just getting your sense on how robust you feel like the governance model is in terms of its ability to um, achieve these targeted outcomes and get us there. Um, there's enough participation from the city, from everybody, you know, involved in, in terms of stakeholders. And I just wanted your thoughts on that. Whomever. But I was just directing it to you because oh, you've... Do you, want, do, you want to, do you want to start? Yeah, okay. sorry. It doesn't matter who. Sorry. Yeah, I think if we look at... I'm just going to go back here for a second. Oh, I can't go back on the slide. Um, I have it here. It's okay. Okay, perfect. I think if you look at the uh, the group of stakeholders um, that have been engaged initially, before the hub was even brought to council back in August, there was meetings that were held with a large group of folk of partners across the city. Um, McMaster, Mohawk. We met with industry partners. Uh, we met with Hale uh, to see if there was interest in the Hamilton area in the purpose of a hub. And the general feedback across the board was that this hub model has been proven in other areas. If we're not there, someone else will take that vacuum and launch a hub potentially that may be able to receive funding or have projects. Whereas in Hamilton, we know strictly based on the huge GHG footprint and that we have from both industry, buildings, and transportation, and the large demand side um, requirements for finding pathways to net zero, that Hamilton is optimally positioned uh, to move forward with this hub itself and be successful in launching projects that lead to real decarbonization efforts and measurable outcomes related to GHG reduction. If I answered your question or not. Councillor? Oh, Dr. Lisa. Through the Deputy Mayor, maybe just to add on that a little bit, just reflecting on some of my past experiences with roundtable efforts within the municipality, you know, from what I'm seeing here, I think, I think we've got the sort of fundamental elements that we need to really move forward effectively with this entity. And, and if I reflect on the, Bay, you know, the, the Hamilton Harbour remedial action planning process that I've been involved in in different points along the way, it's, it's sort of evolved to address issues as they come up. So, so I would hope you know, we would have the same kind of flexibility here, maybe you know, gathering input on, on what that governance structure should look like from the outset. Um, and bringing people together to have those conversations about those sort of tangible targets and timelines. And again, I you know use the the RAP process as a parallel example where it was a lot of those early conversations that est established the pathway forward and created that space where you know stakeholders can benefit from hearing each other's perspectives. They can benefit from knowledge that one might bring to the table that maybe another one doesn't have. They can tap into synergies, pull in expertise as they need it. All of those sorts of helpful things that start to happen when you bring a diverse group of stakeholders around the table. So I, I hope that answers your question, Councillor. It does, thanks. I was yeah. just trying to tease out the tension, which I think you did, um, between the idea that we're investing this little bit of money, right, and then all this other money is coming in and we're like, excited, there's money um, from the federal government coming into this project, and if we don't use this money, someone else is going to have a decarbonization hub where they are, um, and, and versus the, um, the efficacy of doing this, the outcomes that are related to it, and how they're going to improve things in Hamilton. So you've satisfied my answer, and I appreciate you, you explaining Thank that, especially in relation to your past experience. Thanks. Thank you, and Councillor Nan. Uh, thank you, through you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a question as it relates to, I guess, some of the expressed outcomes and the synergy, I think, uh, Dr. Lukasik, you said right up front, the impact of industry in comparison to all the others. And when I think about that, it is a necessary uh, linking between uh, emissions and health. And so when I think about a municipality like Hamilton with the legacy of the industrial impact on human health, we talked about it just, just the other day at Public Health um, in terms of site-specific uh, exemptions that currently are in place, and then what is the goal of decarbonization and how does it get us to a place that leads to deep decarbonization that then has co-benefits 
that result in public health outcomes. And so when we're articulating these goals as a municipality, as a shared interest between ourselves, as a municipal level of government with our industry partners, how are we articulating that deep desire of our municipality of getting to public health as a co-benefit of climate action? Is that articulated in this right now? And how are we, if not, is there an opportunity to? Thank you for the question, Councillor Nan. Through the Deputy Chair to you, Councillor Nan. I think that's implicit in the work that the hub will have to do because, you know, whether you th if the ultimate outcome is reducing GHGs, we're going to see better health outcomes because we have less pollutants or less um, hazards going into our, our air. If we also think about, you know, even I'll give an analogy around how do we make sure we're creating career pathways uh, as well that support it. So I think. Um, this, there's opportunities to incorporate those mandates around health outcomes directly into the work that the hub is doing. And the fact that the sole purpose is to reduce GHG emissions across the region and the, the complementary health benefits that would be uh, seen from those activities, they, I think they go hand in hand. Because if you reduce GHG, um, you know, we've seen it through uh, some of the studies previously around air quality. How can we drive GHGs to net zero, which means that we're not putting uh, contaminants into our air, and that's also going to lead to secondary health benefits. I guess through you, Deputy Mayor, I just get nervous without the explicit expression in our targets, as then we necessarily, um, <clears throat> potentially, <laughs> or necessarily, miss the opportunity to measure that and say, here's what we're striving to achieve with our industry partners because we necessarily, as a level of government, must be accountable for the historical and generational impact of these industries and therefore we necessarily need to go maybe a little bit further than perhaps other communities would have that might have jumped at the opportunity to have a decarb hub. But for the city of Hamilton and the residents that have been generationally negatively impacted, I think we have a necessary mandate to represent uh, those health benefits to be the, the version that results in the deepest decarbonization in order to work with our industry to let them lead the way to get us there, right? Like this is co-leadership. And co-leadership means co-ownership of the outcome. And co-ownership of the outcome is only going to be articulated if it is explicitly in our target. How do we get there? Yeah. Through, through the deputy mayor, I, I hear what you're saying, councillor, as someone who's worked for a very long yeah. time on the other side of this and, you know, danced a jig when I heard the conversations about transition to green st steel, that full on right through to phase two, and the huge benefits that I know, even that, you know, that one major transition, full transition from ArcelorMittal is going to bring on the environmental justice side on the where local air contaminants are concerned. So I, so I hear what you're saying and, and I agree with you. I think we need to be talking about that part of it and recognizing that as being a really integral part of, of why we want to see all these things happen. You know, we, we can talk about green jobs and we can talk about clean tech, but I think the other huge thing here is these are profoundly incredible transformations that mm -hmm. done right, we're going to see unfold in this community. And you're right, a lot of that is tied up in that you know, very very long legacy of of challenges, you know, and 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 that tension between, um, you know, our industrial legacy and and the burden that's been imposed and is still imposed on community members. So I hear you. I think we need to keep on thinking about that and and maybe telling that story as a central part of of all of this work too. And then explicitly through you, Deputy Mayor, is it a possibility? Do you think the door is still open to be able to? explicitly put that in, embed that into our outcomes that we're achieving here together through the DCARB hub? I think the outcomes of the hub are for Hamilton to decide. And the simplest answer is if that's something that we feel as a community needs to be there, it has to be there. Yeah. Thank you. So, and final question, what would be the mechanism to do that? I think through the governance committee and the terms of reference for the governance committee in the hub, those types of requirements could be incorporated as one of the mandates for the hub itself. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions. Okay. Thank you. Uh, last speaker is Alex Wilson, councillor. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And through you, Chair, I just want to pick up on the past two comments. I think there's a real line here, and it's 
we have every right to be excited if, if we get these outcomes. And I think we've said that. If we can achieve this, it's exciting. We've also seen a lot of federal money in particular go to types of apparatuses that don't necessarily efficiently deliver on outcomes in our recent history. And so I think all of us are trying to come in with a, a good governance mindset and say, how do we ensure this isn't one of those stories? And not that there's doubt that it will be, but just how do we ensure? And I think we've heard that how do we enshrine air quality as a key, tar key target? Uh, Delegate Braden, uh, sorry, Delegate Dave Carson this morning, different David, um, was talking about how the transition to hydrogen specifically at AMD should be the top priority of this hub. I guess following up on Councillor Nan's questions, why does the opportunity to set our priorities have to come later once we're at a governance model? Can't Hamilton come into this with some identified priorities? Like, you know, if, if we don't see these outcomes in year two, we're not funding year three, we're not funding year four. We need to see some early work on this. Um, to ensure that this gets those outcomes. Because I think we want to lead together, we want to be in partnership, but I think many of us around the table are also asking, well, what tools and accountability do we have in this process to ensure we get to that state? Um, and clear targets are one, and then I think the willingness of saying, when do we walk away, or if we're not getting what we want, what does that look like too? Yeah, I think uh, I'll add some additional commentary and feedback to that question. For example, what's not shown in the report is that um, there's been a, a study that's been funded uh, jointly through Canadian Steel Producers Association, uh, AMD and Stelco, uh, to, and via NRCAN. And its sole purpose initially was a techno-economic analysis of the potential for hydrogen in steel manufacturing. It was initiated because of some of the discussions that were happening around this type of hub, and then funded to go out and do that type of study, even before the hub was for formalized through a, a mechanism. So I think those types of issues um, are front and center, and even the fact that that type of work is happening before a formal launch uh, speaks to the, the priority that that has uh, in terms of what are the next steps to make sure that we're going to a, a fully net zero carbon uh, economy across uh, the various sectors. And I guess maybe a final question for me is, because this is just information like where there's not recommendations in the report today, so I guess my question is, will the next time that the decarbonization hub comes before council, will we have a set of like clear year one priorities or, you know, we, we know what this is going to look like, what the work we're going to take on? Because I think there's been a lot of potential alignment, but I guess I'm wondering, what are the year one projects that are going to be taken on? What are the outcomes that we'll see? Um, there's sure a lot of opportunity. That's really exciting. Which opportunities are we going to be moving forward on first? Yeah, maybe I can, uh, I've, I've introduced Dan uh, Wicklum earlier in my speech, and he's on uh, video joining us um, uh, today, and he can maybe kind of comment on some of those regarding the, the projects. There has been interest in physically launching projects uh, through the hub. Uh, generally, the first piece is, is the governance to get that set up and, and moving, uh, but I'll let him chime in because uh, he has more experience around the process of going from idea to actual projects and deliverables in a short period of time. Dan? Thanks. Uh, sorry. Dan, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, sir. My name is uh, Dan Wicklum. I'm uh, the CEO of something called the Transition Accelerator. And um, we are a pan-Canadian charity. We're operating across the country doing this type of initiative that is essentially trying to um, link the vision of what regions and municipalities want their uh uh, what want to look like and what's the pathway to get there. Our, our, one of our major operating philosophies is frankly is to put ourselves out of business. Um, so we do this for a living. This is what we've got going um, in several other uh, uh, places, both um, up, up and running and, and planning. But the core for a hub, the key for a hub is it needs to be really um, local and regional leadership. Uh, so run by, managed by, performed by local and regional people. And um, so our whole philosophy is to basically use our methodology as advice and give some support to things like, the, um, if you approve, um, the Hamilton Region Decarbonization Hub. But we frankly stay in the background, and um, it's actually um, a local readership uh, and regional full uh, control. So on that notion of like what um, you know, what would the specific deliverables be in year one, year two, year three? 
if following on my, my my introduction there, we don't feel comfortable actually putting them on paper exactly what would happen year one, year two, year three as a transition accelerator. We feel strongly that we have to set up the structures and actually get the local and regional people um, to, to decide, understand and decide what the options are so that it is really locally and, and, and regionally led rather than ourselves. We see ourselves as basically a supporting function. Um, so in one regard, that it would be difficult, I, I can understand, for a council to say, um, you know, what, what exactly is going to happen. But from the other regard, our experience in other places, including the Edmonton Hydrogen Hub that's almost three years up and running now, is these things are successful when they are essentially um, owned and operated by um, by local and regional um, people and leaders. So we we try to be as explicit as possible on expected outcomes in things like the deck that was presented to you, but we really think it's a critical success factor to, to um, uh, you know, engage the governance structure and local and regional people before taking to the next level of detail. I'm hoping I answered your question. Thank you, and uh, Councillor Wilson. If I could, could I, if I could just add, and I think Dan, maybe you could articulate. I know, for example, in the Edmonton Hub, they've launched a series of, of projects. They're specific to the interest for the the Edmonton region, and I don't want to draw comparisons. But the, the net value of those projects is in excess of $80 million. And that was coordinated activity that was led to, through their hub. So for example, and, and again, I hate to say this is, you know, compare it to Edmonton, but for example, CN was involved in uh, a uh, hydrogen provided locomotion that they test piloted. But that was specific to that area. So I think um, for uh, at this point in time, maybe it's difficult to identify project A, project B, project C, because we need to create the action teams. The action teams will locally inform the projects that are of interest and where there's synergies. So an example might be, uh, let's say, in the buildings. And again, this is just an example because until we actually get off the ground and, and start running rather than uh, having a, a paper concept, um, you know, maybe there are hospitals uh, and industrial facilities that are currently using, let's say, natural gas boiler systems. So maybe a project is in the buildings group, the action team comes together and you have a likes of a hospital, a school, and another industry that says, we're really industry, interested in understanding how to go and electrify our boiler systems. Now, instead of one individual entity trying to figure that out, those synergies can come together. There could be a pilot project. Maybe they put in funding, if there's other funding sources, to launch the project. And then those members and others, uh, and the transparency based on the reporting from the hub itself around those findings would inform now you have momentum where maybe it's not just it's done with one, but other people can adopt that. So I'm, it's not a specific example, but trying to show how once the action teams are established and those action teams create those local priorities and projects, those will be able to move quickly to actual real implementation and then create sort of a, a knock-on effect where more projects occur or the work that's done through the initial project can be expanded to other people that are interested in that same form of technology. Councillor, your time is up. You I, can... I will go on a second time if that's okay. It's just could, one quick Actually, comment. you're the last one, so you could go again. One, one piece here. I know you spent a lot of time talking about a lot of things today. I think this is actually integral. I want to say what I'm hearing is I, we haven't yet set those priorities and maybe this is something that we can move forward on as we <laughs> look at this is... If we hear from our industry partners that the opportunities we take on, they're easiest ones to implement, that's really great news to get early wins, but I think we also know that we're running out of time and we have to be strategic. What we're hearing is that we have one to two industrial partners that are huge in terms of our area emissions. Um, I'm hoping that that can be set as a target and we as a city can take our climate action strategy, not start necessarily from a following or matching when we say, where does anyone else want to lead? We'll follow you, but say, here are the places we want to lead. Does this resonate with anyone and taking more of a leadership role in that conversation? I think lots of folks have said that I'll keep it quick there, but that's just the last piece from me. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for your presentation. You. And we're going to have a mover and a seconder to receive. Oh, Councillor Nan. I'm sorry, I am pressing the icon. I don't believe it's, it's registering here, on so eScribe. I apologize, okay, Councillor. Councillor Nan. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Just uh, before you <laughs> before you go and uh, maybe it's because I need to connect the dots given the, the conversation at public health and the conversation here today. Um, so in this early stage, are there, is there a necessary correlation between uh, the technologies that would be considered quick wins versus the technologies that guarantee no more carcinogens in our air as a result of industry production? In this decarb framework. 
Through the deputy mayor, that's, that's a good question. So I'm, I'm gonna may, maybe speak a little bit more to what I see as being the huge value added of this, because hopefully that'll answer your question. So I think, you know, sitting where I'm sitting, I realize that the city has no regulatory power when it comes to industry. So I look at something like a hub, at, you know, as a round table, as giving the city a lever. Um, and I think, you know, you know, also just reflecting on Councillor Wilson's questions as well, I think that does, that does create that important opportunity for us to talk about both, you know, I, th I think we're going to need to be paying attention to short, medium and long term wins. Um, and, 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 I, and I would, I would expect that an entity like that will be doing that. How could it not, right? Um, I know that, you know, there was reference earlier to an original vision of this being a hydrogen hub and no secret why that would be because of that acknowledgement that for Arcelor alone to make that transition, they're going to need a whole lot of hydrogen. So I, I don't expect you're going to see that piece go away. Um, but, you know, sort of looking at that one as, you know, hopefully some productive dialogue there will keep keep that moving along and provide more information to community on how that's going to unfold. But yeah, I, I hear what you're saying and I think I think that the the big benefits become more obvious in tackling the big issues. Mm -hmm. And and certainly sitting where I'm sitting, I'm really excited about the big issues being talked about there because I think it's really important. Thank you. And then last comment through you, Deputy Mayor, would be around that community first versus technology first solution and how the hub moves us towards, uh, I guess, first of all, in that governance conversation, the definition of what is the community first solutions versus the technology first solutions and having a clear articulation of the goal of those health co-benefits. I think uh, whatever we can do to support that getting on the governance framework and being articulated clearly uh, I'll just say as a representative of, of a segment of population who's been generationally impacted, it, it's, it's one I can't let go of, and it's the accountability check for me sitting around this table in terms of what we're engaging in as a city, recognizing we don't have regulatory power, but then to your point, doctor, using the lever of our participation in this to really lead, lead in a way that responds to our, our community's unique uh, priorities. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you again. Um, we're going to have a mover and a seconder to receive the presentation. Councillor Francis, Councillor Danko, thank you. And we're going to vote on receiving the presentation. And it passes 13 to zero on the report. May I please have a move and a second? Council Wilson, Count, uh, Mayor Horvath, thank you. Wilson, oh, Alex Wilson, I think, it, yeah. Oh, was it Maureen? I don't know, I thought I saw Alex. <laughs> I, either one, either one will do. Um, and okay, so is there any discussion on the item, on the report? I don't see any, so let's move to a, oh, Councillor Kassar. Yeah, just a quick comment. And You're not on the list, so sorry, I didn't see you. I was too slow to hit the button. Okay. Yeah, just a quick comment. It's such an important topic, um, but you know, clearly there's a little bit of unease and maybe nervousness or lack of clarity around the table, and that's where I was initially. Uh, you know, what is a hub? It's not a physical thing. It's not a legal structure. Um, but I think this conversation, what's helped me to understand that our role here, yeah, there'll, there'll be a governance role. I think that's important to provide some direction and get feedback. But I think it's a good example of a role where government can help set something up and allow the community to get things done. We've talked a lot about whole of the community solutions in this week and past weeks. And I think that's a really good example here. So there's an element of trust here and it was mentioned in the report about it's a high trust kind of arrangement. So just some words of encouragement for us here as a council to, it's such an important topic, we need to take some risks, I'm not suggesting that this is a risky proposition, but it's a little uncomfortable, and I think we just need to stay close to it and make sure that the governance model is a good model, 
uh, and have some oversight, but trust that it is going to have some huge benefits because as Councillor Alex Wilson was saying, um, there, there is a lot of possibility here and is really exciting. So, and thank you to staff for bringing this along to us. Okay, thank you. All right, so on the report, uh, can I have a move on a seconder, please? I already did? Oh, sorry, <laughs> okay, I'm moving along here. To approve the recommendation, thank you. And my apologies, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor, it's just to receive the report, that's an error in your chair's oh, procedures. Okay. It's, it's to receive. Okay, we're gonna, all right, we'll just wait a second. Carries 13 nothing. Thank you. We're going to 9.1 consent items. 2023 employer survey citywide. Um, may, uh, first of all, uh, may I have a mover and a seconder to put the item 9.1 on the floor? Is Council Crutch, Councilor um, Spadafora? Is there any discussion? Wow. <laughs> We're all tired now? <laughs> okay. Okay, we will need a, a vote. Thank you. Move it along. And it carries, thank you. Nine two, labor relation activity report and analysis. May I please have a mover and a seconder to put nine two on the floor. Uh, Councillor Jackson, Councillor Beatty, thank you. Is there any discussion on the item? I don't see any, let's vote, thank you. Okay. And it's carried. Thank you. 1320. 9.3. Efficacy on the existing staff COVID 19 verification policy citywide. May I have a mover and a seconder to put it on. Uh, Mayor Horvath, 93 on the floor. Is there any discussion on the item? Uh, Mayor Horvath, please. Uh, thanks, uh, thank, thanks, Councillor uh, Pauls, uh, Deputy Chair Pauls, uh, Deputy Mayor Pauls, rather. Um, I'm, I just want to say very briefly, uh, this is the request that I made to the Chief Medical Officer of Health uh, to give us a, uh, her professional uh, medical take on the efficacy of our current uh, uh, vaccination policy uh, and I just wanted to articulate the fact that I'm happy to receive uh, this information. It, I think it does uh, a lot to clarify uh, where we are at this moment in time. We've been in many different places over many other moments in time but we're at a particular moment in time right now and I want to uh, first of all say thank you uh, to um, uh, to Dr. Richardson for the uh, for the report. I have a motion in that regard and I'm just wanting some clarification as to when I table that motion. So through the Deputy Mayor, if we can receive the report and then you can put your motion on the floor. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, I need, did I do a mover and? Yeah, right ready. through the Deputy Mayor. I had the Mayor as the mover, but I didn't get the seconder. My apologies. I'll second it. Thank you, Councillor. Would you like the vote up, Madam Deputy uh, Mayor? Can yes. we put the vote up, yep. please? Sure. And uh, Mayor? Oh. We have to do the reporting. And it carried 14-0. Than all. Okay, Mayor, uh, sorry, Mayor Horvath. Uh, thanks, um, 
the Deputy Mayor Pauls, I don't know whether this can be put on the screen so that everybody can see it, but it's moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Jackson, uh, an amendment to the mandatory COVID-19 vaccination verification policy, HUR21008 B citywide, A, that the City of Hamilton's mandatory COVID-19 vaccination verification policy requiring proof of vaccination, of full vaccination in the workplace and the following provisions in the current policy be amended by uh, one, pausing all COVID-19 vaccine provisions providing, provided for in the mandatory COVID-19 vaccine verification policy, including new staff as a condition of employment with the City of Hamilton. Two, pausing all COVID-19 vaccine provisions provided for in the mandatory COVID-19 vaccine verification policy in all divisions, including long-term care, paramedic services, and the Red Hill Child Care Centre, three, pausing the general requirement to participate in rapid antigen testing program for all asymptomatic staff and new hires, and B, that the Executive Director Human Resources amend the policy accordingly, effective May 11, 2023. Uh, that's upon the approval of Council, obviously. Uh, and very, brief, very briefly, uh, to speak to this, um, uh, I think it's, it's pretty clear that the advice in the report is specifically about the vaccine policy. There are other things that we know uh, people can and should be doing, uh, depending on uh, their own well-being and their own decision-making. Uh, but when it comes to the advice of, of the uh, chief med or of the medical officer of health for the city of Hamilton, whose advice I've uh, been wanting to receive directly regarding the current vaccine policies that we have in place, uh, I think this is the appropriate to, um, direction for our city at this point in time. Thank you. Um, I don't see any of the speakers. Can I turn the chair to Councillor Jackson for just one minute? moment. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the mayor for taking the leadership here. Um, she wanted uh, Dr. Richardson to do a report to make sure it's, uh, so I want to thank you for that. But I also want to thank uh, Dr. Richardson and, and also Laura Fontana, really. Um, I think uh, working together for the last four, three years, you know, uh, on this. So I want to thank both of them. Uh, there's not much more for me to say. As my council colleagues know all well what, what my unwavering position has been on this issue since a mandatory COVID-19. In addition to the following of the signs and the medical reason offered by Dr. Richardson to pause the policy, I believe there are other, several other reasons to pause this policy. Not at the least of which includes fostering an equitable, diverse, and inclusive workplace for all staff as well as generally taking stride to address our staffing shortage and recruitment issue by telling people that the unvaccinated, that we are open for business and we want the best for them and for the job. And to those staff members, from the people that swept our, our, our street to keep having to clear, to the firefighters, to the head staff, uh, who experience anxiety, work interruptions, significant cash flow issues, and even job loss, as well as those who were actually enabled to apply to work at the city of Hamilton. I personally am sorry that you had to do endure these hardship. And I hope that this comes to an end today with the passing of this motion. So again, thank you to Mayor Horvath for putting the, uh, the motion. And I would ask lastly, if it's possible, if Councillor Jackson would give me the honor of seconding the motion. If it means, if it means, well, I'm in the chair currently. I'll have to give the chair back to you, um, okay. Councillor Pauls. Okay. okay. I'll give the chair back to you. If it, um, if it means that much to you, then, um, and I know your consistent and persistent uh, pursuit of reaching this point uh, through and thereafter the pandemic, you can uh, second the motion if you wish with the mayor's uh, approval. Thank you. Can I just, uh, can I please uh, make a few comments here? Uh, I think everybody around the table knows very well that this was a very difficult uh, process. Um, and the reason that the 
mover and seconder are as they are after many discussions over the last little while was to try to reflect on a, a, a an approach that was I think respectful in terms of all of the opinions around the table uh, and one that brought to bear um, all sides but in a, in a moderate way. Uh, that's why I moved the motion because as people will know, I've had very, I've had a very different perspective as this particular pandemic has uh, has moved along. Uh, but of course, things have changed as the pandemic moved along. Uh, I also know that um, there are folks as well who have come uh, from different places in different ways uh, in terms of how they've addressed this. And my understanding is that there was, and I wasn't here for any of it, but there was quite a difficult. Um, quite a, a number of difficult hurdles and conversations and discussions uh, that happened with the last term of council and in asking uh, Councillor Jackson to second this uh, I thought it was appropriate um, to you know to reflect both sides of, the, of this discussion in a in a moderate way and uh, that's why I asked Councillor Jackson to second the motion and I, I felt that Really, the important thing here is to be able to turn the page, to be able to turn the page on some of the uh, friction and some of the difficulties that uh, uh, that the FAST Council went through and, and so many others went through as well, so many organizations and so many others, uh, that, um, that the best way to do that was to try to kind of take the temperature down a bit. And that's why I asked Councillor Jackson to, um, to move the motion, or to second the motion for me. I prefer it to be that way, frankly, uh, and if Councillor Jackson is uh, okay. prepared to, to, to do that. It, mm -hmm. For me, it's not just, it's about the policy, absolutely. It's about the, the ensuring that there's a, a, a proper advice from our, uh, our, our top public health official uh, here in our city, but it's also symbolic in, in trying to, to really change the channel here and move us along in a way that's respectful of, of the difficulties that have gone on here around this council table, but, but really bringing us to a different place in terms of the tenor of the conversation. Okay, uh, okay. Um, I just wanna say thank you, Mayor, for your explanation, and I understand, and what I'm really concerned is not to put my name on the motion. Uh, definitely, that's not my goal. Uh, my goal was to get this passed, it really is. But I know uh, when we, put motions in, when we ask a seconder, the seconder always, you know, uh, agrees or has a, uh, something involved with it. Uh, and, and they want their name there. But for me, it really doesn't matter. So I thank you for your explanation. And I thank you again for putting this motion. Thank you. And I hope uh, it can pass. Thank you. Let's put the vote up. Oh, we have a speaker's list. Oh, sorry. Uh, Councillor Kretsch. Uh, can you, can we? Point of order. Chair. Chair, point of order. Chair. Okay, can you point be point? Sir, We're I understand the, the frustration. Chair, point um, of order. Can I just tell you, I understand. We're going to go in a vote. Uh, please, I'll talk to you later. And I understand the frustration. Point. We have Councillor Cratch on the speaker's list. Councillor Cratch. Okay, Councillor Cratch. On the, uh, please, Councillor Cratch. Happily oblige, Councillor Pauls. Um, I'll keep it brief. I'm not gonna vote in favor. And I'm not gonna vote in favor because I think that there aren't other measures we're taking as a city right now. This is a measure we're taking. There are others we could be taking. I take seriously what it says in this report. Nonetheless, I'm gonna quote from the report. To support the health and wellness of staff and reduce pressures on both City of Hamilton services and healthcare agencies, strong support and encouragement of vaccination against COVID-19 remains important. Like if it remains important, it remains important. I think back to the discussion we had at our public health meeting where we saw the pressures on our hospital services um, are still very high. No, they're not as high as they were at the height of the pandemic. No, we're not dealing with those kinds of the same levels of impacts, but we're not in a good situation. 
We also haven't really thoroughly here in this body that I've seen, especially in this term of council, had discussions about the impacts of, of COVID in the long term. Uh, we don't always know what those impacts may be or may not be. Um, so I have a sense other people are happy to turn the page. Um, I'm not voting in favor of this, and that's where I stand on the subject. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, anyone else will go on the evening. Anybody else, or we go back on the, can we take the vote, please? Yeah. Councillor, Councillor, please. This is about the vaccine policy, not about all the other things. If there are other things that need to be done, then we'll go for it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, passes 11 to 3. Thank you. Okay. Where are we? There's no um, notice of motions. Okay. General information on other business? That's, please. Okay, we're on number th uh, 12, notice of motion. Are there any notice of motions? I don't see any. Let's, pl uh, do we need to vote? No. Uh, 13, a general information and other business? I don't see. I don't see any. So there's just some amendments to the outstanding business list. Okay, amendment. All right. Do we need to vote for that? I don't have. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so okay, I'm a mover and a seconder, please, for the amendment. Uh, Councillor uh, Francis, uh, Councillor Alex Wilson, thank you. And let's vote on uh, general information. Okay, passes 14 0, 14, private and confidential. 14 1, closed session, April 19, 2023. 14.2, closed session, minutes April 24, 2023. Special GIC, may I have a mover and a seconder to approve? A close, uh, uh, Councillor Spadafora. Councillor Beatty, thank you. And let's go to approve. On a vote, please. And Okay. And the last one is 15 adjournment. We did it. Thank you, counselors, for your hard work. And thank you again. I just need a mover and a seconder, counselor, the mayor Horvath and counselor Tattison to adjourn. Great meeting, thank you again, and it was a privilege being a deputy mayor today. And that vote carried 14-0.